بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولا Welcome everybody to the Safina Society Nothing But Facts live stream on a gray and cloudy Tuesday afternoon and as you know now we now go three times a week we don't go uh, four times a week because we're trying to do other projects and focus on other things such as the improvement of ArcView uh, as you all know ArcView is our online education platform where we have um, hundreds of students alhamdulillah I mean for that we have hundreds of students taking basic courses Arabic courses HIF uh, and plus courses plus is the scholarship track courses where they study mutun in the Arabic language uh, today I want to first make an announcement that a, br- a person I've been following for a while on on Twitter and as some of you may know I uh, came up Uh, I got back on Twitter after having tried to go close to nature, get a goat. That turned out into a catastrophe, okay? And I have to go to court for that. And um, But I'm back on because I couldn't resist answering some of these people. His name is the Truth Shepherd. That's the um, uh, the, the name that he goes by. MashaAllah, to Shepherd of Truth, at Truth Shepherd. He's posted really good stuff on Philistine, on Gaza. And I'm like, who is this guy? He is wearing a cowboy hat and everything. It's an AI picture, but... Um, well, today, he said, today I proudly took my shahada and was welcomed into Islam. Islam is the truth. I bear witness that there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. I was talking one to, uh, while back with Sheikh Yahya Rodas, Sheikh Yasir Fahmi, and I was saying, you know these Iraq, Afghanistan, you know, uh, former military, these guys? I believe these guys are actually f- far closer to to accepting Islam than what people imagine. They have like an, a, a, an emotional hatred for Islam, all right, that results from their wars. But when they're comparing, if you look at what Islam is bringing to the table in the United States versus what liberalism is bringing, I, they would naturally align with Islam. And what is liberalism bringing other than because of the failure of Christianity? It just failed. Failed to, to stop this, this, this disease, of liberalism and wokeness and that's what they're fearing okay there is a cold there's a cold civil war in america and those guys i would say if they just looked at islam sincerely they're gonna love it and it's happening there's another person just took their shahada recently and this is someone who i've seen in the, some of the comments of my page and i um saw some of her posts her name is ali forza and this is um, not a political commentator. She, she likes the spiritual posts that different shiuch put up. And she also declared right here on Twitter that she entered Islam. So I truly believe, and I've said it many times, Islam will find a home in America. Meaning many, 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 millions upon millions upon millions of hearts, will, Islam will enter into it. And once that happens, you can't remove that religion from that land. Bi'idhnillahi ta'ala, of course. Now let's get to our subject. Akhiru zaman the end of time, is an important subject in Islam. And it also has its own stories in Judaism and in Christianity. And we're going to do a comparison and we're going to see how these things line up. And is there a group out there? Well, there is. Obviously, we wouldn't be doing this. That believes that we're actually on the cusp of something. Therefore, we have to take action. Most importantly, they're capable of taking major action that influence you and me and men, millions of other people. That's why this is relevant today. This is not just theory and storytelling about the end of times. Nobody cares about that, okay? About other religions' end of times. They have influence and impact. And with that, we have, really, who's becoming one of the pretty much go-to resident experts on comparative religion, specifically Judaism and Christianity, very well versed in the Bible, very well versed in the Torah. Reverse Orientalism is happening here. Speaks Hebrew. Dr. Ari Atai, welcome to the Safina Society Nothing But Facts live stream. Thank you for having me. How are you? Alhamdulillah, very good, very good. Uh, of course, you all know Dr. Ari Atai from the Blogging Theology um, uh, live streams. The Blogging Theology live streams, I recommend you, you watch this. We plan on picking off picking up where they left off. So I watched three or four of them. I think you've been on three or four times. 
mm. talking about Christianity, but one time recently about radical Judaism. And I, I watched that uh, whole, whole uh, program, and I want to pick up sort of where you, 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 you left off. For the, for the viewers, if you want to hear about the fundamental uh, tenets of Judaism, you go to that one. The first half is about that. I want to go into this end times of Judaism, and mainly the first question I have to ask is an epistemological question. This is the boring question in terms of the drama and the juicy stuff, but it's the most important one. Is the end time described directly in the word of God as Jews believe it to be the Torah? <laughs> so um, there are passages in the Hebrew Bible, right? The Tanakh, um, especially in Isaiah and the book of Ezekiel, the book of Zechariah, uh, that uh, Orthodox, or I guess we can say traditional or normative uh, Jewish authorities believe are describing the end times. Um, now, Jews have an interesting way of reading these texts, right? So they believe in this idea that uh, Jewish sacred text is, is polyvalent in the sense that the text might be describing some sort of historical situation that's happening at that time that's called the Peshat, Mm -hmm. Or like, I guess we can call it sort of the vahir meaning of the text, the apparent clear, clear meaning of the text, the apparent meaning. Uh, but uh, scripture is also sort of oracular. It's sort of foreshadowing things to happen in the future. Um, so, for example, um, the, uh, in Zechariah chapter uh, 12, there's this um, description of someone who's going to be pierced. Um, and he's a great uh, sort of general or military leader. Now, this could have been referring to somebody at that time when this book was actually written, uh, but according to this principle uh, that uh, there's multiple layers of meaning in the text, um, most Jewish authorities would say that this is also foreshadowing the death of one of the two messiahs that's going to come towards the end of time. So this is another interesting thing is that most people don't know this, uh, but... Uh, most Jews, at least the traditional, the Orthodox, I mean, these terms are a little bit, um, I don't, uh, we have to sort of unpack them a little bit more, um, but we'll just use the term traditional. In traditional Judaism, which is, you know, belief in the, the, the Tanakh and the Talmud, um, there's this belief in two messiahs that are going to come towards the end of time, right? So Zechariah chapter 12 is actually describing the martyrdom of what they call the Josephine Messiah. Okay, so there's two messiahs. The first messiah that's going to come uh, is called the Mashiach ben Yosef. So the Messiah, son of Joseph. So this is a military leader um, who's, again, there's indications of him in the Tanakh. He's more fleshed out in the Talmud and in the Midrashim, you know, the sort of tefasir, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, in the in the traditional uh, in the classical tradition, uh, so this is someone who's going to come. He's going to fight uh, against Gog and Magog, or Edom. As so, Edom. This is you know the the, the rabbinical authorities in the Talmud. They use all these sort of weird terms, kind of these ciphers to sort of it's kind of coded language. So Edom is actually a reference to Rome or Christianity, Christ, Christian Europe, something like that. All of these are sort of called Edom. So, so the Josephine Messiah is going to fight against Europeans, essentially, or against Christians, um, and he's going to be martyred by them. He's going to be pierced somehow. They're going to impale him or something. Why is he called the Josephine Messiah? Well, because uh, he, his father is from one of the tribes of Joseph, either Ephraim or Manasseh, uh, and his mother's from David. Mm. Um, so he's, uh, he's, he's a Josephine Messiah. But then when he's, he's martyred, then someone called Mashiach Hamelech ben David will arrive on the scene. Uh, so this is the Davidic king Messiah. And this is sort of the Messiah now for the, for the Jews. So this is the real, this is the main guy right here, right? So this Messiah, uh, he will deal with, according to Jewish authorities, he's really going to deal more with sort of the Muslims, right? Ishmael, as they say, Ishmael. 
Um, and basically, he's going to uh, conquer the world uh, through um, a type of military um, campaign. And then he's going to uh, basically implement the Torah as the law of the world, right? Hmm. Uh, and rule from Jerusalem. Uh, so that, that's basically what it is in a nutshell. So that's a little known fact that Jews actually believe in two major messiahs. Now, if you look in the Old Testament, a lot of people are called Messiah, right? The term Messiah is a bit ubiquitous in the Old Testament. In Old Testament, this is Christian terminology, right? Um, so Christians call it the Old Testament. The, the Jews call it the Tanakh, um, which stands for Torah, Nebim, Ketobim. Um, uh, we can also call it the Hebrew Bible. So in, in the Tanakh, um, different types of people are called Messiah, uh, Mashiach. So you have King Messiahs, like David and Solomon, but also Gentiles like Cyrus in Isaiah 45.1, right? And the Lord said to his Mashiach, Koresh, who's, who's Cyrus, mm. which is kind of interesting because um, there was this trend going, uh, going down a few years ago. Some people thought Trump was some sort of messiah <laughs> because Isaiah 45 won, right? And yeah. Trump is number 45 and wow. he moved the capital of, to, to Jerusalem. Mm. Uh, so they saw sort of these messianic um, descriptions in him. Um, so kings are called messiah and then priests are called messiah like the sons of Aaron, they're called messiahs. And then prophets are also called messiahs, right? Uh, but when we're dealing with these, with the sort of eschatology of Judaism, the focus is really on these two main messiahs and really on that last one, that is the messiah, <clears throat> okay? And then certain things sort of have to happen. So, so how do you know that this is, how, how do the Jews know that this is the actual messiah? Well. Uh, the rabbis, they say that there are certain indications that he has to fulfill, basically, um, in order for him to qualify as the Messiah. So th there, was a, there was a second century um, Jewish leader named Simon Bar Kokhba, um, who was endorsed as being the Messiah in the second century in Palestine. And uh, actually, Rabbi Akiva, who was probably the greatest uh, of the what's known as the Tanaim, or the first or second century sort of Jewish rabbis, authorities. He endorsed Bar Kokhba as being the Messiah. Mm. Bar Kokhba actually uh, was able to defeat the, the Romans at Fort Antonia in, in, in Jerusalem. Um, and so he, he seized um, uh, the Temple Mount, as it were. Um, he, um, he was starting to uh, mint coins. Uh, he was intending on bringing back the sacrifices. He was going to rebuild the temple. But then he was killed by the Romans. So he was not the Messiah um, because the Messiah, according to uh, traditional authorities, is not only from the seed of David uh, and not only will he bring back the what's known as the Malkuth David, the, the sort of uh, throne or rule of David, but he will also inaugurate um, an ingathering of the Jews from diaspora. It's called the Kibbutz Galut. This is something that he has to do. So uh, Simon Bar Kokhba was viewed by many as being the the, the Messiah that time. Hadrian yeah. then essentially committed a Holocaust against them all, he um, did, yeah. and he wiped out a massive, massive percentage of the Jews that existed at that time. So yeah. how do they then explain that? Do they just say we got it wrong? He wasn't the Messiah. Yeah, so basically Akiva was wrong. I mean, he was a good candidate, mm -hmm. right? Um, but ultimately, the Messiah cannot be killed. So that, that's, that's the, the deal breaker, okay. right? If he's killed, then he's, uh, he's not the Messiah. Um, you know, one of my rabbi colleagues told the story. He said that a Christian one time um, was speaking to him, and, and the Christian said, you know, this, uh, this, um, your, greatest, your greatest rabbi from the second century, Rabbi Akiva, he made a mistake. He thought the Messiah was the wrong person. So mm -hmm. in other words, you're probably making a mistake. Jesus yeah. is the Messiah. Um, and then so the rabbi said to him, well, why wasn't, why wasn't uh, Bar Kokhba the Messiah? And the Christian said, well, he didn't fulfill everything the Messiah was going to do. And the Romans killed him. Yeah. And then the rabbi said, well, you know, there you go. You know, <laughs> <laughs> this is why, this is why yeah. we reject 
at least your version of, yeah. of Jesus, peace be upon him, uh, because he didn't fulfill at least uh, what is traditionally known to be considered to be sort of these criteria for the, yeah. the Davidic Messiah. And then he was killed by the Romans. Let um, me, let, let, since we're on the subject of Jesus, let me ask you a simple question. Um, we often know that it's anti-Semitic to say that the rabbis are responsible for the uh, um, killing of Jesus, of Christ, in, in the Christian worldview. And that really was the Romans who did it uh, because he was a rebel, right? Um, but there's also pretty much known that he only had 12 followers. So why would the Romans really care about a rebel with only 12 followers? Story doesn't yeah. add up. Yeah, um, I mean it's. Uh, you're right. It's it's not PC. Uh, the New Testament is very clear. The New Testament um, basically paints the Romans as just the instrument. Yeah. Kind of just being used by this kind of bloodthirsty Jewish uh, crowd. Mm -hmm. um, and then Maimonides, um, when he speaks of Isa alayhi salam, he's very proud to take credit for his death. He, he doesn't even actually mention the Romans. Mm. Um, why do the Gospels mention the Romans? Um, I, I don't, that's a good question. I don't know. Um, um, you know, Pontius Pilate is certainly depicted in the Gospels. Um, maybe the, the Gospel authors wanted to sort of aggrandize the Jesus movement because it wasn't very big, apparently, um, and sort of um, depict it as being very popular, something that was uh, very consequential for its time. Uh, but they were very careful not to indict Roman authorities as being complicit in the death of Jesus. Mm -hmm. It was this, this bloodthirsty rabble uh, that's calling for his death. Uh, mm -hmm. So in the Gospel of Matthew, of course, you know, Pontius Pilate washes his hands and says, I am, I am innocent of the blood of this man. You want to crucify him, then you, you can do it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Uh, th this type of thing. Um, but Maimonides says, no, we, we, um, we judged him in the Beit Dean in the Sanhedrin. Uh, he was found guilty of blasphemy and then, uh, we, uh, we killed him. Mm -hmm. And, and the Talmud goes in a little bit more into specifics as to how it was probably done because the worst types of criminals, uh, they were stoned, mm -hmm. uh, till death. And then their bodies were crucified post-mortem, um, to act as a deterrent. Yeah, uh, and that was the worst way to, to go. Mm -hmm. So this is what this is what Jewish sources say, say happened to, to Jesus of, of Nazareth. Um, but yeah, there's no Roman involvement in in uh, in in Maimonides. Um, and then the whole depiction of Pilate uh, does not sort of match what we have as far as other historical sources like Philo and, and Josephus. Uh, Pilate was Pilate would not have a, an Adam's weight of compunction. Mm. to squat any type of rebellion from any Jew. I mean, he was a, made a career of crucifying uh, Jews. Yeah. Uh, but the New Testament is clear. I mean, Paul, who is a Jew, right? He's writing First Thessalonians. This is, uh, this is his first uh, epistle, according to almost a consensus of New Testament scholars. And Paul says in First, first Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 14 and 15, that describing the Jews, they killed the Lord Jesus mm. and, and their own prophets to persecute us uh, and our contra uh, they please not God and are contrary to all men, mm. right? Mm. And so this verse is uh, notorious uh, as being sort of held up as this um, sort of um, something emblematic of New yeah. Testament anti-Semitism. Um, and there's other passages uh, as well. Of course, um, this whole idea of, uh, of, I mean, we can probably talk about this in the context of, of Zionism, this idea of modern dispensationalism that the Jewish covenant uh, remains open. <laughs> this is totally foreign to traditional Christianity. I and mean, it's very, very clear if you read the, Old, if you read the New Testament uh, that, um, that the Jews have been to a certain degree replaced. There's a new covenant, right? And that covenant is established uh, with Jesus. So belief in Jesus is without question. You have to believe that Jesus is the Messiah Mm. Um, in order to attain salvation. This idea that there's two side-by-side -side, uh, covenants, um, which is, again, uh, a position that is held today by millions of Christian Zionists. 
you know, where does this actually come from? I, I think we can actually trace this uh, mm. to, to a certain person that maybe we can talk about that. Uh, but this is totally foreign to traditional Christianity. It's yeah. completely foreign. So uh, let's talk now, before we get into how the Zionists have uh, gotten onto this, uh, or sorry, the evangelicals have gotten onto the Zionist wave. Uh, let's t- tell us more about the, the Jewish Messiah. He's got to rule from Jerusalem. He's going mm-hmm. to bring all the Jews into the Holy Land. Yeah. He's going to be the most powerful king on, in the world. Yeah. And apply the Torah laws everywhere in the world. Yeah. Is yeah. there is, are there signs of his coming the way we would have signs of the end of time? Do they have a similar concept? Okay, when this happens, this happens this time, then expect the Messiah. Yeah, so generally when um I think most most traditional and orthodox would agree with this, mm-hmm. that generally when the Jews uh, engage in what's known as teshuva, the teshuva movement, when Jews sort of come back to God. Toba. Jews, re, toba, exactly. Hmm. When, they, when they repent to God, when there's sort of a global uh, returning to God, uh, then God will send the Messiah. So the, the rabbis say that in, in every generation, there's, there's a potential Messiah, uh, but God will, in a sense, sort of um, assess the uh, devotion of his people uh, the children of Israel, and if they're in a good state, if they're moving towards Toba or Teshuvah, then God will raise that person as as the Messiah. But mm-hmm. if not, then that person will just simply he'll die, and time will move on. Um, so that's in the general sense. Um, now, um, th- there are other uh, traditional authorities, or other Orthodox rabbis, contemporary rabbis today, that have unfortunately. Um, bought into the Zionist uh, blasphemy, which is not traditional Judaism, but they try to incorporate Zionist principles into their understanding of orthodoxy, who say things like, well, um, there's nothing wrong with having a a Jewish state. It's actually something that we can find evidence for in the Old Testament. Uh, So they look at these sort of obscure passages in the Tanakh um, when there's, so in other words, we can sort of get the ball moving. Mm -hmm. We can start a, um, we can start coming back to the Holy Land, uh, we can uh, start settling in the land, we can take power, um, we're going to start planting fruits and things like that, and we'll raise up our civilization. And so this will be sort of the, um, the beginning of the redemption, as they say. Mm-hmm. So, so in other words, when the Holy Land uh, becomes more and more Jewish, um, at least in its orientation, uh, then this is a sign uh, that mm. the Messiah will come because we've started the redemption. Again, this whole idea is completely foreign to traditional Judaism prior to 150 years ago. Uh, prior to 150 years ago, every Jew on the planet believed that exile was divinely decreed, that it was actually a uh, rebellion against God to um, try to go back to the Holy Land or to any land and establish some sort of Jewish na- nation. Uh, the Jew was to be diasporic until the coming of the Messiah. The Messiah yeah. will start everything. Yeah. You, don't, you don't get the ball moving and then wait for the Messiah to come and finish the job, right? Um, but if we're talking about most Orthodox today who unfortunately um, have degrees of Zionism um, in, sort of, in, their, in their sort of minds, I guess you can say, yeah, you do have this idea that he'll be from the seed of David, the... the the throne of David will return, um, that he will inaugurate or he will continue, uh, he will complete the ingathering of the Jews from diaspora. They mention things like he'll be a shofet sedet, he'll be a, right, a righteous judge. Uh, he will rebuild, this is a big one, he, he will rebuild the Beit HaMikdash, Beit Maqdis. So he's mm. going to rebuild the temple, the third temple, right? Uh, and then when he sort of subdues the entire planet, he will usher in uh, an era of, of global peace. Hmm. Um, there's a difference of opinion about this one. Some of the rabbis say that the Messiah will be able to raise the dead. Maimonides doesn't believe that. He's sort of a, I guess you could say, sort of naturalistic, uh, messianic. Uh, but people like Sadia Gaon, Rabbi Sadia Gaon says the Messiah can actually uh, raise the dead and things like that. But nobody believes the Messiah is divine in any way. He's a human being. Uh, another thing that the Messiah will do, according to 
uh, traditional authorities is that he will bring forth the Aron Habirit, which is the Ark of the Covenant, uh, which most rabbis say it's buried under the, it's sort of interred under the Temple Mount somewhere. I think all these legends about, you know, some island uh, on the Nile River, these are maybe sort of just red herrings or con controlled yeah. distraction or something like that. Uh, almost everyone says it's under the Temple Mount somewhere. Yeah. Um, the other thing that the Messiah will do, which is interesting, is that he will, uh, he will sacrifice a three-year-old perfect red heifer, mm -hmm. right? Uh, the ashes of which must be used to purify the, the Kohani, right? The temple priests. Uh, and currently, I, the last I checked um, was in October. There are currently five perfect red heifers, and they have to be perfect. So no, no, you know, black or white hairs, um, um, no, 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 like saddles or yokes or anything have ever been used on them. So five of them have been flown into uh, so-called Israel from a ranch in Texas. Mm. Um, so I think they're almost two years old now, sometime next year, uh, and all five are still perfect. So this would be the 10th red heifer in their history. They've had nine in their 2000 year history. Mm. Um, so the 10th one has to be, this is according to Leviticus, it's a must. The ashes of one red heifer can last for hundreds and hundreds of years, but they have to have these ashes in order to purify not only the sort of the, the priests, but also the, um, the instruments that are used in the temple, the water of the temple, things like that. Um, so, so if they find this 10th one, do they then believe Messiah is right around the... Yeah, so Maimonides, he actually says that the 10th one will be slaughtered by the Messiah, Mashiach. Oh, the Messiah himself, okay. Yeah, the Messiah himself. I don't think there's a total agreement on that, uh, but I imagine that most Jewish authorities would say that the 10th one... Okay, that, before... That it's either a major sign of the coming of the Messiah or the Messiah himself will slaughter the 10th one. Good. Uh, before I ask my next question, uh, you mentioned the exile which, and that... Many Jews believe that exile is their destiny. Well, mm -hmm. interestingly, Surah Al Hashr says, mm -hmm. If Allah, if it had not been that Allah has destined for them exile, then He would have punished them in this world. So, is where do they get this concept that exile is is destined for them? Is it yeah. something biblical in the Torah as a consequence? If you do this, then you'll be exiled forever. Or is it just the words of their leaders? Um, so it, it comes from the Torah. Okay. So um, before the, the sort of blasphemy of what's known as religious Jewish Zionism, I mean, this is for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, almost 2,000 years. They believed based on explicit texts in the Hebrew Bible that their holy land from that their exile from the holy land was was justified it was divinely decreed explicit um, text from the bible explicit that it was given on condition mm. this is this is what they say it was given on a condition mm. uh obey god or else the land will reject you god will thrust you out this is stated dozens of times in the mm. Tanakh. you'll mm. find this in deuteronomy jeremiah isaiah ezekiel for for example just pulling up a verse here jeremiah 16 uh 13 uh, it says, therefore, I will cast you out of this land and into mm. a land that you do not know. In Deuteronomy, you will be root, uprooted from the land that you're entering to possess. Um, Ezekiel chapter 33, the prophet Ezekiel, he says, then the word of the Lord came to me saying, son of man, the people living in these ruins in the land of Israel are saying, Abraham was only one man, yet he possessed the land. But we are many. Surely the land has been given to us as our possession. Therefore, say to them, so God is telling uh, Ezekiel, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Since you eat meat with the blood still in it and look to your idols and shed blood, shall you then possess the land? This is a rhetorical question. In other words, because you sinned against God, God will mm. cause you to dispossess the land. Mm. And it continues, you rely on the sword. You do detestable things. And each of you defiles his neighbor's wife. Should you then possess the land? Mm. Right? So according to traditional Judaism, no one other than God, by means of the Messiah, can initiate a return to the Holy Land. No one other than God, by means of the Messiah, can reestablish uh, a Jewish nation, a Jewish kingdom, a Jewish homeland. And the Messiah has yet to come for the Jews. They have to wait for the Messiah. The Jews are under a 2,000-year divinely mandated diaspora. Mm. Again, this is what all Jews believed prior to 150 years ago. This is traditional Judaism. Any attempt 
to reestablish any land through military means in lieu of the Messiah was viewed as rebellion wow. against God. Even if there's some uninhabited island uh, the size of a football stadium mm -hmm. in, the, in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, the Jews have no right to it whatsoever, wow. at least according to traditional orthodoxy. I mean, the tr traditional orthodox today are called the heretic Jews or the Charedim, you know, not these Zionist so-called orthodox uh, herita uh, heretics. Uh, the Charedim, they, they further cite something known as the three oaths. This is very important, the three oaths. Okay, it's called the Shalosh Shavuot. So this is found in the Talmud, uh, but it's based upon uh, a book in the Tanakh called the Shir Hashirim, the Song of Solomon. Uh, so the three oaths is very, very important. The, the, the Charedim, the traditional Orthodox, they charge these, uh, these uh, so-called Orthodox uh, Zionist Jews with breaking these oaths. The three oaths. So, the three oaths, yeah. So the first okay. two oaths, they relate to the Jews, and the third one relates to the, to the uh, Gentiles. So oath number one says, we will not return en masse to the Holy Land. That's the oath. That's that's oath number one. We will not return en masse to the Holy Land. In other words, uh, Jews cannot make any attempt to, to end the exile. Okay. Mm. And again, this includes establishing some temporary Jewish state or kingdom outside of the Holy Land. The Jews must continue to live in exile as well, long as God wants. And, and, and how do they know when enough is enough? Well, God sends the Messiah. Wow. Right. There was a famous mm. rabbi, Rabbi Dushinsky. Uh, who was the chief rabbi um, of a group in Jerusalem called the Aida uh, Charedit, uh, which means like the House of the Tremblers, mm. right? So this was an ultra-Orthodox um, uh, organization uh, uh, founded in Palestine. So in 1947, Rabbi Dushinsky, he spoke to the United Nations famously, and he said, quote, we express our definite opposition to a Jewish state in any part of Palestine. Wow. End quote, because he's under an oath from mm -hmm. God. Oath number two, we will not rebel against any nation. All right. So, so in other words, Jews must be loyal citizens of mm -hmm. any host nation, My even if they are being oppressed. So the traditional Orthodox, they say that if some uh, oppressive Gentile king is oppressing you and humiliating you because mm -hmm. you're Jewish, they say, thank Hashem, thank God at that moment. Thank God that you are being oppressed and you are not the oppressor. Wow. And then oath number three, um, the nations will not oppress the Jews excessively. Uh, in other words, it will never be too much to handle. If you it keep those two oaths. Yes. Mm. It will never, yeah, it, it, it will never justify a premature sort of um, man led ending of the exile and returning to the Holy Land. In other words, nothing justifies ending the exile without the Mashiach, right? And so there was a famous, there was a famous rabbi. Um, so there, there's different anti-Zionist Orthodox group, groups. One is called Maturi Karta. One is called the Satmar, right? So there's a famous Satmar rabbi named Yoel Teitelbaum. Um, and so he's one of the founders of these Hasidic dynasties. That's very anti-Zionist. Uh, he actually said, this is on record. He said that the Holocaust was divine punishment for violating the three oaths. Wow. Who's, what was his name again? Rabbi Yoel Teitelbaum. T Teitelbaum. I heard the name. Yes. Yeah. He's um, the founder of the, the Satmar Hasidic dynasty. Passed away. Um, he's passed away. Yeah. Uh, so God's punishment upon European, uh, the, the Holocaust was God's punishment upon, upon European Jewry for wow. Zionism. Wow. That's his opinion. Because violating the three oaths is, is no wow. joke. Uh, you know, according according to the rabbi, um, and here's here's something interesting too. The, the traditional Orthodox uh, anti-Zionist they cite a passage in the Torah to demonstrate uh, the importance of upholding the three oaths in our time. So, in the book of Numbers, right? So, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, the fourth book of the Torah. Okay, it's called the book of Numbers. So, we're told, and this is something that they point out, we're told that some of the Israelites under Moses. They wanted to leave the wilderness prematurely mm. without God's permission wow. and enter the Holy Land, right? Mm. <laughs> so, so God decreed uh, 40 years of wandering or exile. But some of the people of Moses wanted to end that exile immediately and mm. march into the Holy Land. So they're actually quoted in numbers. So they say, the, the Hebrew says, 
So the people are quoted, here we are, and we will go up to the place which the Lord has promised. Hmm. In other words, the people are saying, some of these people among uh, the people of Moses, they said, we're not going to wait any longer. We're going to go right now. Gotcha. You know, this is taking too long. We're <laughs> going now. Hmm. And then listen to the response of Moses. It says, Vayomer Moshe, Moses said, Lama ze atem ovrim et pi Adonai. He said, why are you disobeying the Lord's command? Subhanallah. <laughs> this will never succeed. <laughs> Subhanallah. Subhanallah. And, uh, leaving exile early and entering the land and establishing the land without God's permission, Moses says, will never succeed. Subhanallah. And then he says, he says, Al Ta'alu, do not go up. Do not make Aliyah, right? Al Ta'alu, do not make Aliyah. Ki ain Adonai, bi kirkakim, because the Lord is not with you. Hmm. Right? And so anti Zionist rabbis to this day <laughs> continue to tell Zionist Jews that this blasphemous project of theirs called modern Israel will never succeed. SubhanAllah. Al Ta'alu al Allah, yes. as a, just as the Quran says. Um, exactly. Because the Lord is not with you. Mm. In, in, in our terms, there's no tawfiq from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is why Rabbi Dushinsky's predecessor, Rabbi uh, Joseph Chaim Sonnenfeld, mm. right? Uh, he said, quote, very famous quote, Dr. Herzl uh, comes not from the Lord, but from mm. the side of pollution. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. <laughs> uh, this is the theology of the famous uh, Naturakai group. That's that, one of the that's one of the groups, yeah. So there's there's certain so the Satmar is one Hasidic group, the Ventura Karta is another group. There are certain group unfortunately they're very much becoming the minority now, but a, 150 years ago, every Jew on the planet insane. took this position, up upheld the three oaths that they that they are a diasporic people. And any attempt insane. any attempt to to resettle the land or to resettle any land, even if it's uninhabited. Is mm. total rebellion against God. And these three oaths, can you remind me, was there a certain prophet that took this oath upon them? So this is mentioned in Shira Hashirim, so the, the Song of Solomon. This is in the, it's one of the books of the Old Testament. Yeah. So this is believed by uh, the traditional Jews to be written by the prophet Suleiman alayhi salam. Uh, and then the Talmud is believed by traditional Jews also to have um, a degree of revelation so the Talmud isn't simply just sort of exegesis. So in traditional mm -hmm. Judaism, there's, there's sort of three levels of revelation, three tiered revelation. So the highest revelation are the five books of Moses. Okay. And so, so Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And so the rabbis say these five books were revealed to Moses word for word. Panim al panim is what they use face to face without mm -hmm. any, any type of intermediation word for word, but basically like our concept of the Quran, ipsissima verba of God, the very words of God. Mm. And then uh, you have the rest of the uh, Hebrew Bible, um, which, uh, so, so then you have the books of the prophets. So books like Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. And so here is a lower tier revelation. This is more like the inspired word of God, mm. right? So while words the, of the prophet. The words of the prophet, yeah. So these, yeah. this is like a type of ilham or iha, something like that. Where it's, like a hadith qudsi type of thing. Hadith qudsi, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, so still, it's, still sacred text. Okay. And, and then you have a third tier, which is called the kitobim or the hagiography. These are books like Psalms, uh, Proverbs, First and Second Kings, First and Second Samuel, um, Song of Solomon. So this book as well, Song of Solomon. So still a sacred text. Right, still uh, a divinely revealed text in some sense, but then you have the Talmud, which is two parts: the Mishnah and Gemara. So the Talmud is also considered a type of revelation, a non-prophetic revelation. Okay, um, so uh, so in the Talmud, these three oaths are fleshed out, mm. uh, and mm. so this is this is considered to be uh, completely authoritative uh, among Jews. So uh, just to summarize that, so it's direct word of God, then inspired meanings written by a prophet, yes. then directly written by a prophet, mm -hmm. and then inspired meanings of righteous people. Righteous people, exactly. Okay, so that's the four levels. Yeah, uh, exactly. and, and each is considered that it's law. Yes, this is, this is traditional Judaism for thousands of, for 
uh, two thousand years. This is wow. this is Judaism. Yeah. And you said though that they the now that Israel has been founded, they found their workarounds to make it that yes, you can prepare a land for the Messiah. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Now let's get to the Messiah. Uh, some while back, there was a young fifteen-year-old who was deemed to be a genius, deemed to have memorized you know their sacred texts, and uh, was claimed to be a potential possible messiah so many so much so that elders would be kissing his hands in the streets of israel have did you hear about this yeah um because that's my my lead in there is that who are the latest claimants to be messiah um yeah i heard of him i don't remember his name um but yeah he's he's considered to be the yanuka that's what they call him the yanuka Yanuka. is sort of a a title that means like the genius Mm -hmm. um I don't know if people are claiming him to be the Messiah. Mm-hmm. Um, it doesn't seem like that's likely. Uh, uh, there are no claimants uh, right now, correct? Yeah, as far as I know, there are no claimants. So there was, um, in 1994, one of the founders of the of one of the Hasidic dynasties uh, called Chabad uh, passed away. His name was Rabbi Menachem Mendel Schneerson. So he died as an old man. He was like 92 years old or something like that. Uh, and there is, there's varied reports, different reports that he claimed to be the Messiah. Many of his followers believed he was the Messiah. Mm-hmm. Uh, even after his death, some of his followers said that he's going to be resurrected uh, mm-hmm. any minute uh, and, and he's going to regather the Jews and so on and so forth. Um, but um, it is pretty well known that this rabbi, this rabbi who's called the Rebbe Menachem Mendel Schneerson, Uh, He told Netanyahu in 1984, when Netanyahu was the UN ambassador uh, to Israel, he told Netanyahu, this is quite well known, that Netanyahu will be leading Israel when the Mashiach arrives. Wow. Um, So, yeah, and and there's even some, you might even be able to find this on maybe even YouTube from uh, the early 90s or something, where he's, he's speaking to Netanyahu and he's saying, you know, what have you done to prepare the land for the Messiah? You need to wow. get moving here because there's only a few hours left. That's the other thing is that that most Jews believe traditionally that the coming of the Messiah uh, must take place uh, before the year 6,000 after creation, right? Um, he has to come and, and accomplish everything before the year 6,000. Mm-hmm. And you find this um, basically everywhere. Uh, before the seventh day, because a thousand years yeah. is, a, is, is a day is a day in the sight of the Lord. So mm-hmm. it's called the Sabbath of the Lord. So the the year now, mm-hmm. by the way, is fifty seven eighty four after creation. Okay, so there's only about two hundred some years left. Yeah, it's called the final what, sixteen years left. The the final yeah <clears throat> the final hours of the sixth day. That's how the rabbis put it, and that's that's what Schneerson said to Netanyahu in, in that in that famous video where he said, there's only a few hours left. What are you doing to prepare mm. the land? Right. And, and so, uh, how long is the action of the Messiah? So for example, is his life on the earth in Judaism, a 40 year life, a hundred year life, you know, because mm. then you can do the math backwards. Yeah. Um, as far as I know, the, um, at the year 6,000, we're going to enter into something called the Olam Haba, so the world to come. So the sort of, um, the, uh, the nature of the world will change somehow mm-hmm. um, in the year 6,000. Uh, but as far as, um, so there's 200, you know, something, 217 years left uh, until we get to the seventh day, and that's the beginning of the Olam Haba. So the Messiah could come at any, at any, at any time. He has to come and accomplish everything yeah. before the year 6,000. Um, but the absolute deadline is the year 6,000. Mm-hmm. So as far as how long he's going to live, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, Let's but get his, to... his coming is deemed to be absolutely imminent. Um, Let's get to some uh, where, where these ideas hit the road um, and oh. hit reality. Groups that believe in the coming of the Messiah... Um, we know that in Islam, pretty much all of Ahl Sunnah believe in a concept of the Mahdi, right? Mm. At, well, not pretty much. They must. 
yeah. then definitely must believe also that Prophet Isa Ibn Maryam will come back. Yeah. So in Judaism right now, is it a small group that are Messianic or would you say that it's only 15 million Jews in the world, right? Yeah. So we could probably much gauge how much of the Orthodox world are Messiah seekers, are really believing in this and waiting for it? And is there an anti-Messiah movement that's saying, hey guys, stop all this, just live your life? Yeah, so the majority of Jews are very secular um, mm -hmm. So, it, at least in the West, Judaism is divided among three, there's three divisions, kind of tripartite. So, you have the, basically modern orthodoxy, which is about 10% mm -hmm. uh, of Western Jews. And they all believe in the Messiah, um, and they believe mm -hmm. that the Messiah is an actual person, is a personal yeah. Messiah from the tribe of David, etc. They're only about 10%, and then something like 35% are considered uh, conservative, um, and they have differing ideas of Messiah. Many of them believe, yeah, he's going to be a person, but some of them say, no, the Messiah is a righteous polity of some sort, a righteous government, even a mm. righteous sort of uh, yeah, epoch of time, uh, an era of, um, of uh, a flourishing in the world, something like that. Yeah. And then you have something 38, 39%, something like that, reform Jews. So here, basically, Judaism is, you know, they're kind of Jewish by culture, yeah. Um, you have many of them reject that the the Bible is the word of God. It's just sort of a historical record. Uh, many of them don't even. Many of them cancel the Messiah. They consider the Messiah, the whole concept of the Messiah to be sort of um, it, it's sort of a, a hassle because uh, it's a bit. It, it seems a bit subversive to say that here we are living in these countries, but when our when our man comes, you know, you better watch out. Yeah. Um, so the, many of them just completely abandon the whole idea of messianism. And many of them are actually atheists. Many Reform Jews are atheists. In fact, in our masjid here, not too long ago, we had an interfaith dialogue, and there was a Muslim brother, uh, and they were talking about something, um, the ethics of Islam or something like that. And then there was this female rabbi who went up and said, I'm an atheist. She comes from a Reform synagogue. So strange. Uh, and people thought it was a joke. They started, they started laughing. They started uh, just the beginning of a Jewish joke or something. <laughs> they thought it was yeah, exactly <laughs> a rabbi because joke. This the stand-up uh, session yeah. was about to, the set was about to start. <laughs> no, she was completely serious. Um, and then you have a whole bunch of Jews that are just you know they're ethnically Jewish, but they don't they're not religious at all. But among the Orthodox, yeah, the Messiah. I mean, Maimonides is very clear. Maimonides, his thirteen principles of Jewish faith is. Is, is beloved to the Orthodox mm. the world over. Uh, so this is something that he articulated um, uh, in the 12th century. Um, it's mentioned in his Mishnah Torah, something he wrote in, actual, in actually Hebrew. He usually wrote in Judeo-Arabic. So he has these 13 principles. And he says very clearly, if you don't believe in any one of these principles, you are a kofer, he says, you are a kafir. You mm. have to believe in these. So number 12 of 13 is the coming of the Messiah. You have to believe in the Messiah. Yeah. Or else he considers you uh, an apostate. <clears throat> and so those, uh, those um, descriptions of the Messiah that I gave are primarily from the, co the commentary of Maimonides, who is accepted generally by, by Orthodox the world over. So everyone, if they identify as Orthodox, they have this idea of a personal Messiah who's going to come. And his coming seems to be very imminent in sort mm -hmm. of the Jewish uh, worldview. So we have the covered the beliefs on the Messiah. Who is the anti? Um, who is the antagonist of the Messiah? Do they have an antichrist, a Dajjal, as we would have it? Um, not as we would have it. So there's this idea in the Torah of something called Amalek, right? Mm -hmm. So Amalek, um, also known as the Amalekites, sometimes just called Amalek. So according to the Torah, the first group to attack the Israelites, to oppose the Israelites while they were in the wilderness, was this group called the Amalekites. Mm -hmm. um, and the Amalekites, they, for some reason, they just, they hate the Bani Israel. They hate the Israelites. They want to kill them. Uh, they want to exterminate them. Uh, and so uh, in, in the Bible, you have these, in the Hebrew Bible, you have these commandments coming from God, apparently, mm -hmm. to the Israelites to exterminate the Amalekites. Okay, so for example, First Samuel chapter 15, King Saul, the first king of Israel, was told uh, to, uh, to exterminate the Amalekites. 
but Saul, he didn't do the job correctly, and he spared the Amalekite king, whose name was Agag. And so Agag sort of fled, I guess. I mean, later on, he was killed. Uh, but apparently, the Amalekites um, survived somehow. And so um, in the book of Exodus, uh, there's a passage uh, where God is the speaker. And God says that from generation to generation, midor midor in Hebrew, from generation to generation, I will make war on Amalek, hmm. right? Uh, so in other words, many rabbis, many Orthodox rabbis take this to mean uh, that in every generation, uh, there, there is some group um, that embodies the spirit of Amalek yep. and must be exterminated, mm -hmm. right? So if there's, that's probably the closest thing you'll get to an idea of an, of a, of an, anti, an antichrist. Um, that there's this, there's going to be this group of people uh, that are going to always oppose Israel, uh, yeah. and and try to basically uh, destroy Israel um, until until the coming of the Messiah, and then he will basically take them out. So I understood this to be uh, literal that Amalek are people that are wicked. Uh, and we're supposed to fight them, or the you know, Jew, Jews are supposed to fight them physically, right? So I'm talking to a young man. His name is Rabbi Andrew Meyer, mm -hmm. and he always corrects me on this. He said, no, 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 no. It's not that. It's it's metaphoric. We don't kill. The Ten Commandments say you should not murder, you should not kill. And Amalek is evil in general. Now, I take this as, oh, this is some kind of modernism and metaphor right? Everything is a metaphor. And we know how we treat those types of people in Islam, right? Uh, you really need to have conditions set in place uh, regarding the language of the text in order to deem something to be a metaphor right. because God and his prophet speak directly and there are no tricks and games in the speech. I would mm. like to ask you is what this young man is saying, is that a mainstream view or is it a minority view, maybe a sanitizing um, interpretation yeah. for, for Westerners? Um, yeah, um, I, don't, I don't think that's, I, th I think it's a bit sanitizing. So, so modern traditional Jews um, tend to interpret these commandments against Amalek on genealogical grounds. So mm -hmm. in other words, any and all descendants of Amalek must be killed irrespective of their culture. Mm -hmm. um, this is why when it comes to this, the seven nations, we can say the Canaanites, broadly speaking, there, there is conversion. The seven nations that are in, you know, from the river to the sea, they can actually convert and to, um, to become a Ben Noah. So in other words, the seven, they can adopt the seven Noahidic laws, or they can actually convert to Judaism. But there's difference of opinion about the conversion of an Amalekite. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a difference of opinion as to whether he should be allowed to convert uh, or not. If not, then he should be killed. Yeah. However, many would argue uh, that it's just simply impossible to identify who, who is an Amalekite. So yeah. in, other, in other words, this, compa this commandment simply cannot be fulfilled, right? Um, it's just impossible to tell who's an Amalekite. Uh, Maimonides, he, he limits the application of this mitzvah to destroy Amalek uh, to a Jewish king. He says only an anointed Jewish king <clears throat> can carry out this mitzvah. But the mitzvah is there. It's it's not it's not mansuch. The Jews don't believe in mansuch. They don't believe yeah. in nusch. So this commandment is there. It's sort of just suspended. But we need an anointed Jewish king, and it seems like he's talking about the Messiah. Um, and other authorities say that it will apply once again when the Messiah comes and he's taken control of uh, of the covenant land, um, the Eretz Israel. Um, uh, so so then so yeah, the commandment is there. Um, now, there is this idea also that, like I said, the, you know, Scripture has different levels of meaning. Um, so um, the commandment to destroy Amalek is not abrogated. It's, it's still valid, but we don't know who Am Amalek is. Um, uh, but there's also this idea that there is, a, there is a spiritual interpretation of the text. So even like the Orthodox will say that, you know, one must strive to remove or to kill or destroy the Amalek within, right? These sort of impulses that we have mm -hmm. uh, that want us to rebel against God and this type of thing. 
Uh, but that's not all it means. And no traditional authority would say that's all it means. It's, mm. it's just the, the, the internal Amalek and it's all this kind of botany stuff. And yeah. no, no, the, the commandment is literal, but it's suspended, right? Now, the Zionists, they actually teach that no, Amalek <clears throat> does not refer to any specific race, but a, a mentality, a mm. mindset that will continue perpetually. So the Romans were Amalek and the Nazis were Amalek and, yeah. you know, I Iran was Amalek. And now they're saying, obviously, you know what BB said, yeah. this guy, yeah. uh, that the Palestinians, you know, these, they're Amalek. They're yeah. Amalek. We have a yeah. duty. Remember what Amalek has done to you. Remember our proud history of Joshua, the son of Nun and mm -hmm. what he did. And we know what he did. We, he went into Canaan and slaughtered, you know, at least according to the book of Joshua, uh, slaughtered the indigenous uh, people of, of Palestine, men, women, and children indiscriminately. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's that's how these sort of Zionists uh, interpret these verses about uh, Amalek. Benzi Lieberman in 2004, he, he's the director, the former director of Israel Land Authority. He said, yeah. quote, the Palestinians are Amalek, we will destroy them. Uh, let's now turn to evangelicals. Mm. Evangelicals are... Um, <clears throat> Have 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 become the biggest Zionists. Yeah. In reality, that there were evangelicals in the time of the Balfour Declaration, yeah. and there are evangelicals, of course, today that are pushing this in Congress and making sure that um, this is going through and that the aid money is sent and all that, and working with the lobby and uh, uh, to make sure that Israel is established. Their uh, theology is so diametrically opposed to Jewish theology. Yeah. Who swindled the evangelicals <laughs> into believing that this is good for them when it clearly it is it's not. Yeah. Yeah, so this is this is a big mystery, right? Um, but I yeah, I think we can sort of trace it down to a, to a, a few candidates here. Uh, but again, just to reiterate that traditionally uh, Christians believed that uh, that Christians are now the chosen people, right? The, mm -hmm. the Jews are no longer the chosen people. Uh, for Christians to support um, the building of a third temple uh, is is absolutely blasphemous because in the New Testament, Jesus uh, is clearly described as being the new temple, mm -hmm. uh, the, the final temple. Um, in, in Romans 6 and in Hebrews 10, you know, Paul says that, Jesus was the, the be-all, end-all sacrifice. He's the ultimate temple. He's the ultimate high priest, the ultimate sacrifice. And yet Christian Zionists, they fully support the third temple where sin yeah. sacrifices will apparently return one day according to Jewish messianism. Uh, so Christian Zionism is, is, is just indefensible from a biblical perspective. Um, so what actually happened here? Um, how did Zionism become so popular among American Protestants? Well, in 1831, there was this Anglican preacher uh, named John Nelson Darby, okay? Mm. And so he was one of the primary organizers of a non-denominational Christian movement called the Plymouth Brethren. The Plymouth Brethren. So, so you know, this is what happens when church tradition uh, is ignored. So, so Darby is considered to be the father of something called modern dispensationalism. Okay, so what is, what is modern dispensationalism? So this is basically... Uh, it's this notion that there will be a future restoration of the earthly nation of Israel, okay? Uh, but this also includes this idea that the Mosaic Covenant um, uh, and the Christic Covenant are two valid coexisting covenants. They're both valid, mm. okay? Uh, 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 this is also known as dual covenant theology. In other words, Christians do not need to convert Jews. Mm -hmm. The Jews already have a valid covenant. Jews are still chosen by God, irrespective of their belief in Jesus. Okay. So if, if we just think about the theological implications of this for Christianity, I mean, this implies that Christ only came for the Gentiles, mm. not the Jews. That's the implication that it actually directly contradicts the New Testament Jesus. Uh, you know, when he said, I was not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Mm. Right. So, you know, instead of, you know, for God so loved the world, he should have said, for God so loved the Gentiles mm -hmm. that he gave his only begotten son because the Jews don't need him. 
yeah. least not yet. So, so according to Darby, let's get into his eschatology then. Uh, sacred history is divided into seven dispensations. What, what are these seven dispensations? So these are sort of seven periods of time that demonstrate how God deals with humanity. Mm -hmm. Okay, so he calls the first one innocence. So this is like Adam and Eve before the fall. And then the second dispensation, he calls conscience, conscience. So there's Adam and Eve after the fall, Cain and Abel, uh, Noah. And then the third one he calls civil government. So this is the aftermath of the flood. And then the fourth one he calls promise. This is the patriarchal period from Genesis 6 to like Exodus 19. Uh, then the fifth one is called the law of Moses. Okay, so the covenant code, the, the Sinaitic uh, covenant. Uh, the sixth one he calls grace. This is the covenant of Christ, also known as the church age. And this goes until the rapture, and I'll talk about that. And then the final one, the final dispensation is called the kingdom. So five, six, and seven are the most important. The law of Moses, and then the church age, and then the kingdom. And the kingdom, the seventh dispensation, is also called the millennium. The millennium. Okay, so this is when Christ will rule from Jerusalem after his what's known as the parousia or the second coming. This is described in Revelation chapter 20. Uh, now, what is this last dispensation? Again, what is this kingdom? The kingdom, also known as the millennium, is the one the literal 1,000 year future reign of Christ from Jerusalem. Hmm. That Christ will rule the reconstituted uh, physical, ethnic, Jewish state of Israel. So national Israel will be restored, according to Darby. According to Darby, the Old Testament prophesizes not so much the church age, but really the kingdom, the millennium, where Christ rules the national Jewish state of Israel. <clears throat> so just to take you through the, the sequence of events here, and then we'll talk about how Darby's dispensationalism became so popular. So for first we have the rapture, right? The rapture, this is based on a text, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, where Christians are sort of taken off the planet. They sort of uh, are raptured into the, the sky, as it were. Uh, so according to Darby, the church is removed uh, from the earth. The Christians are taken up, you know. So if you're Christian, you, you don't want to be left behind, right? Of mm -hmm. course, there's a famous book series called Left Behind based on, yeah. this, uh, based on this doctrine. And then there's going to be a horrible seven-year period known as the tribulation. Mm. Okay, so this is apparently described in Matthew and Revelation. This is a time of massive, widespread evil upon the earth. Uh, during the tribulation, the Antichrist emerges, uh, who will sit in the temple, the third temple. This is what Paul says. He will declare himself God while sitting in the temple. Mm. Um, now. This is unique in Darby, such that Christians will be gone before the tribulation, okay? They will be raptured before the tribulation. So this is called pre-trib eschatology, pre-tribulation eschatology. The, the rapture is pre-trib. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's pre-trib, then there's mid-trib, <laughs> then there's post-trib eschatology, mm. okay? In other words, the rapture is either before, in the middle of, or after the tribulation. Okay. So for so for Darby, Christians will ex, will experience none of the evils of the tribulation. Mm. They're going to be raptured. <clears throat> then you have the second coming, the parousia, the second coming of Jesus. Then you have the kingdom, also known as the millennium. This is going to manifest. Mm. So the second coming for Darby and dispensationalism is pre-millennial. In other words, the second coming is prior to the kingdom. Mm. There was actually a, an opinion among Protestants that the second coming was post-millennial, that the kingdom would manifest by God's grace uh, before the second coming of Jesus, which, which meant that basically the whole world was about to repent and accept Christ, become Christian, and then when he comes, they're going to welcome him with open arms. So this was very popular up until the 20th century, and then World War I, World War II, and now almost nobody takes uh, that position. Uh, for most Christians, okay, the kingdom is already here. So here I'm talking about like basically Catholic Christians, okay? So for Catholics, the kingdom is already here. The kingdom of God and the church age are essentially synonymous, mm. right? So, so Christ is ruling over it right now, right? So Catholics, they take this language of millennium to be symbolic. It's not a literal 
thousand year earthly mm. reign. It's a spiritual reality. We, we, we are living it right now. Now, the book of Revelation, it states, however, that Satan will be bound during the millennium. So how is Satan bound right now? Well, Catholics explain that Satan is bound in the sense that he cannot prevent people from receiving the gospel. Okay. So this, this position is called a millennium, millennialism, a millennialism. Again, this is essentially the Catholic position. So there's no rapture in the Protestant sense. So then when Christ comes back, according to Catholics, he, he won't rule for a thousand years. He'll come and judge humanity. He'll judge the nations immediately. And then the righteous will be taken body and soul into heaven. We can call that a rapture if you want. And then the evil ones, including Satan and his demons, will go to hell or what the book of Revelation calls a lake of fire. Mm -hmm. Okay, but let's get back to Darby. So Darby advanced a pre-trib, pre-mill dispensational eschatology. So let me just break that down again. What does that mean? The rapture will occur before the tribulation. No, no Christians will experience the tribulation. And the second coming of Jesus will occur before the millennium, the, the literal thousand-year kingdom mm -hmm. reign. Before that. Mm. Before that, yeah. And then Darby was also a dual covenant dispensationalist. So what does that mean? Again, this means that the Mosaic covenant and the Christic covenant are two valid coexisting covenants. They're both valid. So when Jesus returns to rule over national Israel, all of Israel will eventually believe in him. Mm. Right? And there's going to be a reversal. He came the first time, they almost all rejected him. When he comes the second time, they will all believe in him. Okay. Now, now, Darby was famous for saying that the Bible must be rightly divided. This is a very famous phrase from Darby. He actually takes it from the letters of Paul, but Paul uses it in a different way. The Bible must be rightly divided. What he meant was that much of the New Testament does not actually apply to Christians, but only to Jews. Mm. That, that Jesus primarily in the synoptic gospel, so Matthew, Mark, and Luke, He's actually teaching the Mosaic Covenant, okay? But in John's Gospel, as well as through Paul's writings, Jesus was advancing the Christian Covenant. So there's almost like two Gospels. Mm. So according, according to Darby, Jesus was teaching both dispensations, okay? Both, both covenants are valid, side mm. by side. Now, Darby's dispensationalism uh, eventually found its way across the pond uh, to America, so Pastor James Hall Brooks, he kind of just fell in love with Darby, um, with his teachings, right? Don't get the wrong idea. Um, and then Brooks, he, he was in St. Louis, and there was an annual Bible conference called the Niagara Bible Conference, and Brooks was often the keynote speaker. So it was at this conference when Darbyan uh, dispensationalism uh, became more and more popular via James Brooks. And Brooks had a preacher friend named Dwight Moody. Uh, and Moody would later establish the famous Moody Bible Institute in Chicago, where Bible is their middle name, as Bart Ehrman always says. Mm. Uh, and then Moody also became a Darbyan dispensationalist. And then Moody befriended a man named Cyrus Ingerson Schofield. Okay. Now, Schofield was a morally questionable lawyer and politician. He was accused of multiple charges of theft, uh, bribery, forgery. He was a deadbeat husband and father, a self-described alcoholic uh, turned Christian minister. So he became an ordained pastor in Dallas in 1883, hmm. Schofield. In 1888, he wrote a treatise called Rightly Dividing the Word of Truth, Rightly hmm. Dividing the Word of Truth. So he started calling himself uh, C.I. Schofield, D.D., that is Doctor of Divinity, although there's okay. no record of him ever graduating <laughs> mm. from seminary. So it seemed like he gave himself kind of an honorary doctorate, <laughs> kind of like what Dartmouth College did for Dr. Seuss. Right? <laughs> honorary doctorate. Dr. Seuss wasn't a real doctor. C.I. Schofield was not a real doctor. Mm. In 1909, Schofield wrote his Schofield Study Bible. This was published by Oxford. So this Bible, the Schofield Study Bible, had a massive, massive impact on American Protestants and evangelicals. It is no exaggeration that this Bible turned millions of American Protestants into Christian Zionists. I mean, it changed a generation of preachers. His, his Bible translation is essentially the King James translation, but he added all of these strange notes 
in his commentary. <clears throat> so in his commentary of Genesis 12, 3, okay, so this is the most infamous one. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is God's promise to Abraham. Okay, so Schofield's commentary, it changed the game. So basically God says to Abraham, I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. So here's what Schofield wrote, right? He said, and curse those who curse you, wonderfully fulfilled in the history of the dispersion. It has invariably fared ill with the people who have persecuted the Jew, mm. well with those who have protected him. The future will still more remarkably prove this principle, mm. right? So, so, so basically, Schofield is applying this verse to ethnic Jews, uh, contemporary ethnic Jews, that, this, that the Jews are still chosen, that anyone who curses Jews have in, uh, will be cursed by God. And so after Schofield, it became ubiquitous among Protestants that Christians owe unconditional, unquestionable loyalty to the Jewish people because mm. they never ceased to be chosen. Okay, mm. this is Schofield's commentary. And so this doggish Christian loyalty, this, uh, this pathetic, almost slavish mm -hmm. Christian loyalty to ethnic Jews extends to the modern murderous state of Israel because eventually Jesus will rule Israel. That's mm. Jesus' future kingdom, mm. right? But as we said, in light of the New Testament, and this is a grave misleading, misreading of Genesis chapter 12 because Paul actually quotes, he actually, Paul has a commentary on Genesis chapter 12. And Paul says that when it says Abraham and his seed, his seed is only Jesus, not the Israelites. Mm. This, is, this is what Paul says in Galatians chapter 3. Mm. He says, if, if you belong to, to Christ, then you are the seed of Abraham. This is a conditional statement in, in Galatians 3. In other words, you have to believe in Jesus or else you're no longer chosen. Mm. Right? So according to the New Testament, uh, the church is the new Israel. The church is a new Zion. Right, uh, which does and can include some ethnic Jews as well, but but belief in Jesus without is without question. You have to believe in Jesus according to the New Testament. Okay, the Last Supper, um, the, at the Last Supper, th this is this is when the pronouncement and initiation of the New Covenant co covenant uh, occurred. This was on Mount Zion, on Holy Thursday, and then the descent of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost occurred in the same upper room 50 days later on Mount Zion. So both the establishment of the new covenant as well as the proclamation of the new covenant happened on Mount Zion in Jerusalem. So you see what the authors of the New Testament are saying. The Christian church is the new Zion. Mm. When Thomas Aquinas wrote his hymns praising Zion, there's a bunch of hymns that Aquinas wrote where he's praising Zion. He's praising the Christian church, mm. not, not some future secular Jewish ethnostate. Yeah. So how, how did Schofield actually do it? So, so in 2005, uh, Joseph Canfield, he wrote a biography about Schofield. Uh, it's called the, the Incredible Schofield and His Bible. So mm -hmm. a, according to Canfield, in 1901, Schofield joined an, an exclusive males-only secret society called the Lotus Club. Mm. And, and Canfield suggests that someone highly influential within the club he thinks it was another lawyer named Samuel Untemeyer, uh, basically promoted and financed Schofield's Bible project. In other words, Schofield had powerful American Zionists bankrolling his project. Mm. Schofield was the textbook definition of what's known as a useful idiot, mm -hmm. right? Someone who's used by powerful people to do their bidding without really understanding the consequences of his, mm. of his actions. So in 1948, when you know, Israel became a state, Darby and dispensationalism through Schofield exploded even more in popularity among Western Protestants. So Israel has been restored, you see, just as Darby said. So this further vindicated dispensationalism. And so the Christian Zionists, they were saying, you know, we better be nice to Israel or else God will curse us. According to Genesis, you know, 12, 3, we better, we better be nice to Israel because it is Jesus' future kingdom. Hmm. Now, one of Schofield's students uh, was named Louis Schaefer. He died in 1952. And Schaefer founded the Dallas Theological Seminary in 1924. So he was actually the president of, of Dallas Theological Seminary until 1952. 
A famous alumnus of DTS uh, is a man named Hal Lindsey, and he's still alive. In 1973, uh, Lindsey wrote this book that took the world by storm. Uh, it, it had the power of 30 Harry Potters. Wow. Uh, it was called The Late Great Planet Earth. Hmm. Okay, Millions upon millions of copies were sold. I mean, it seemed like everyone in America was reading this book about end times prophecies in the Bible mm. through a lens of Darby and dispensationalism. Mm. It was even made into a film that was narrated by Orson Welles. So Hal Lindsey, by the way, uh, he said in 1979 that, that Jesus would return in 1988 because there's a verse in Matthew 24 where Jesus, at least the Matthean Jesus says, this generation shall not pass away until all these things are fulfilled, the present generation will live to see it all. So mm. apparently Jesus was speaking about this restored kingdom. So one generation is 40 years, right? Mm -hmm. In 1948, the restoration of national Israel, uh, also known as the Nakba, plus 40, 1988, right? Mm -hmm. So that never happened. Um, in 1984, uh, Oxford put out the new Schofield uh, study mm -hmm. Bible, okay? Mm -hmm. And they added this clarifying comment. For a nation to commit the sin of anti-Semitism brings hmm. inevitable judgment. Hmm. For a nation to commit the sin of anti-Semitism brings inevitable judgment. It's ajib. You know the new. You know the New Testament. Jesus, he said that the that the the only unforgivable sin was blasphemy against hmm. the Holy Spirit. Yeah. But now in today's you know zeitgeist, we're constantly told that any critique of Zionism uh, is anti-Semitic. So so anti. Anti-Zionism is a form of anti-Semitism. This is what we're told. Yeah. So, then, so then Christians who read that note from Schofield uh, must only conclude that anti-Zionism is the unforgivable sin in the sight of God. For a nation to commit the sin of anti-Semitism, a form of which is anti-Zionism, brings inevitable judgment. Right? And there's a bunch of things that he says. For example, Schofield, in his commentary of Hosea chapter 1, verse 10, this is what he said. He said, the expression, my people, I'm me in Hebrew, is used in the Old Testament exclusively of Israel, mm. nation. He's just wrong here. He's demonstrably wrong. I, I, Isaiah 19.25, it says, Baruch Ami Mitzrayim, blessed be Egypt, my people. He's just wrong. In his mm. commentary of Genesis, Schofield wrote, quote, the Palestinian covenant gives the conditions under which Israel, he's talking about physical Israel, uh, entered the promised land. It is important to see that the nation has never as yet taken the land under the unconditional Abrahamic covenant, nor has it ever possessed the whole land. This is just wrong. If you read Joshua 21.43, this is what it says. So the Lord gave Israel all the land, kol ha'eretz, it says in the Hebrew, all the land. He had sworn to their ancestors, and they took possession of it and settled there. So Schofield wants us to think that this is still an outstanding promise, that mm -hmm. God has not yet fulfilled his side of the deal. Mm -hmm. Right? It's really amazing. And then he says, two dispossessions and restorations have been accomplished. Israel is now in the third dispersion from which she will be restored at mm -hmm. the return of the Lord as king. So I think Christians they need to ask themselves, they need to ask themselves a very, very important question. Who are you going to believe? Who do you follow, Schofield or Scripture? Yeah. Qu Darby uh, writes this. It seems it has one beneficiary, which is the Zionist Jews. So yeah. who's behind Darby? There, there's no, he's not, ben Christians are not benefiting anything from this. There must be something behind Darby. What motivated yeah. him to do this? I don't know. Maybe Shaitan probably. <laughs> I mean, that's a good question. You know, it's a, the like the uh, as one of my teachers said. You know, the the it's not of every bad idea. Yeah, it, you take take it back far enough. It, it, It'll go to at least. least but at are, least. is there are there Zionist thinkers at the time? Zionism, Christian Zionism, actually predates Jewish Zionism. So Christian Zionism actually goes back to like the 16th century or something. Yeah. <clears throat> but mm. what is the exact motivation of Darby? I don't I don't know. Because don't know. Uh, when was he writing in in relative to Herzl? So he's, yeah, so he's 18, he's before Herzl. He's so before he's, Herzl. He's like 1831 is when the, is mm. when the, um, the, the brethren, the Plymouth brethren were founded. So this idea that, um, 
Zionism came around and the beginnings of what we now call the Israel lobby is developing, oh. that influences uh, the evangelicals, evangelical world. That's actually not correct because Darby yeah. predates. Yeah. Uh, maybe, yeah. you know. Yeah, in Schofield, he wrote his his famous uh, treatise in, in 1888. You know, in the so first, well, the well first Zionist conference was in 1897. Yeah. This and is well so, before that. Well before that, and even 1897, for the next few years, it's laughed at, yeah. right? And so it's very strange. What would make them so? Was it was it uh, an issue that they don't like the idea of people going to hell, and they live Christians and Jews? So let's find a way, like almost like a perennialist relativist type of thing, where nobody really goes to hell and everything is good. Yeah, I mean, I've I've thought about that. It's, there's a lot of similarities with with uh, with the Darby and dispensationalism and kind of the perennial philosophy, mm -hmm. right? That these covenants remain open and you know things like that. Yeah. Maybe that was the motivation. Maybe it it sort of was intended to be um, a something feel -good. that a feel good type of thing, exactly. Yeah. And then they just it just you know that's the thing. It just blew up, and and people don't think about the the consequences of of, of what they say or what they do. Yeah. I could I see the you know, a, a Zionist loving this idea. Let's fund this book and let's make sure it spreads far and wide. Right. But uh, sort of laughing at it simultaneously because their end times like yeah. uh, results when they finally get to the meeting point, they got totally opposite beliefs. Right. Yeah. I mean, the Book of Revelation <laughs> says that Revelation chapter two that only one hundred forty four thousand Israelites will go to heaven anyway. Yeah. So twelve thousand from the <laughs> from from each tribe. <laughs> sure, sure, I mean. I do. <laughs> so um, we we talked about these things. Now the Christians, though, do have an antichrist. The Christians, yes. The and Christians the Christian, an what are what are the signs of the Christian antichrist? I've come upon many evangelicals that mm. say the Islamic Messiah, mm. even they now know about the Mahdi, will be is the Christian antichrist. So in this sense. Islamic and Christian end times, they sort of do meet up in opposites, in a sense. Mm -hmm. From the Christian yeah. worldview, it does meet up. Yeah, so the Antichrist, so the term Antichrist is used a couple of times in the New Testament. So Paul uses it, sorry, the, the, uh, the author of the first epistle of John, he's called the Elder. He uses it in chapter 2, verse 22. And he says something very interesting. He says, whoever does not believe Jesus is the Christ is an Antichrist. Mm -hmm. Right, which is very interesting because, <laughs> you know, like uh, yeah, a lot of million antichrists. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I mean, Muslims and Christians believe that Jesus is the Christ, at least in some sense, but the Jews don't believe. So mm -hmm. it seems like this language is, is sort of, uh, you know, sort of anti-Jewish polemic here. Uh, but Paul also mentions the antichrist in First Thessalonians, right? Uh, and that he 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 says something just very brief. He says that the antichrist will sit in the temple. Mm -hmm. Okay, and declare himself to be God. So Christian scholars have somehow worked out that halfway through the tribulation, three and a half years into the tribulation, the Antichrist, who made some sort of peace treaty or something with, with Israel, will actually disobey Israel and then seize the temple and, and then start oppressing the people of God. Hmm. Um, uh, but as far as uh, details... Um, that's all it really says, and then there's a lot of speculation from early church fathers and things like that. But but you're right, it, it, and I just I wanted to mention as well a very a very common deception actually that's used by Christian apologists is to say that the Muslim Messiah is the Mehdi. Yeah. Right. So they use that term Messiah. Um, you know, that's what they call him, the Muslim Messiah. So mm -hmm. obviously the Mehdi. Um, I mean, it's totally wrong. The Mehdi is is the guided one from the Ahlul Bayt. Of, mm -hmm. of, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So he'll be a leader of Muslims, but he's he's not the Messiah. So I always correct Christians, and I think they're doing this. I don't know. It seems like they should know better. I want to have a good opinion of people, but you know, people are there's shayateen from the from the ins. Uh, the Quran tells us explicitly many many times that the Messiah is Isa bin Maryam. Yeah. Right. So that's that's something that I think um, we should stress in, in interfaith dialogue is that we have something in common and that of obviously the, our concept of messianism is a bit different, but the Messiah, according to the Quran, which is our primary source is uh, the Messiah is Jesus, the son of Mary, Jesus of Nazareth, the same Jesus, peace be upon him, who lived 2000 years ago 
uh, in, in Galilee. Um, so that's, that's an important, uh, I think, dis uh, distinction to make between the Mehdi and the Messiah. Mm -hmm. um, and because I think people are just being misled by these, by yeah. these creatures that have yeah. these sort of anti-Muslim polemical bents to them or something. Uh, it's funny that I uh, was watching one evangelical and, you know, they, they, they raise themselves up to be ministers very quick. As soon as they repent, um, they become ministers and yeah. there's no training in between. And they were completely confused by the concept. So they liked the idea that the Muslim Mahdi, as they oh. call it, is the Antichrist. Then yeah. they have a big problem with the idea that we then believe that Jesus is going to come back. And they don't know how to put two and two together with that. Covered. But um, yeah. uh, so I think we covered everything that we wanted to cover. This the the I think for a lot of people the Darby uh, mm -hmm. predating Herzl, mm -hmm. it's something new to a lot of people because you know the usual talk is that the is the 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 Jews cooked up this stuff mm -hmm. um, no, and it's snuck predated. it into the you know Protestant uh, Bible, which yeah. is clearly not the case. This was a Christian thing, yeah. Like you said, Edmund Allenby. David mm -hmm. Lloyd George, these are, you know, maybe it's just, you know, Zionism is something that it was in their strategic interest mm -hmm. because they had these colonies in the, in the, in the Muslim majority world. And, yeah. you know, it's trying to make some allies amongst the Jews and who yeah. knows, it's, 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 it's a, it's a deep rabbit hole. Are, is, are the Rothschilds involved in the Schofield Bible at all? Is this conspiracy theory? Are they truly involved in funding I, it? I haven't heard anything like that. Okay. Um, I haven't heard. No, I don't know. Uh, last question: Did you read the book "Forcing God's Hands" that was written way back? Uh, I've I've heard of it. I haven't read it though. It's essentially yeah. the, the it's it's um, Christian Zionism essentially, mm. and the policies that it produces, essentially for the yeah. sake of bringing back Christ. Yeah, I mean, we we have these Christian Zionist leaders and preachers on television yeah. with millions of followers. Stoking hatred for Muslims, mm -hmm. uh, offering these like half-witted, ridiculous, futuristic interpretations of biblical verses, yeah. where they're like, you know, this is, uh, you know, B Babylon the Great and the, yeah. the mother of harlots, Saddam yeah. Hussein and Iraq, all for the glory of. I mean, it's war hawking, yeah. war hawking for Israel by means of bad theology. Yeah. Christian Zionism is a murderous ideology. Mm -hmm. There's there is a book I recommend by Dr. Stephen Sizer. He's a Christian. He's non-Zionist. It's called Christian Zionism: A Roadmap to Armageddon. Mm. And that's exactly what it is. And this is a roadmap to Armageddon. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's it's pretty it's pretty crazy. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, but you're exactly right. I mean, Christian Zionism predates uh, any type of Jewish Zionism, at least before it became very popular within within yeah. Judaism. Uh, Shay Ajib, uh, well, I uh, thank you for your time. We kept you a little over an hour, but Jazakallah Khairan, thank you so much. Jazakallah Khairan, thanks for having me. And um, hopefully, we'll see where where all this goes, and 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 perhaps have you back for um, the continuation as we see where the things on the ground mm. uh, go with this whole situation in Gaza. But again, Jazakallah Khairan, thank you again. Uh, uh, Dr. Ali Atai is in California. He is a professor at Zaytuna College. He teaches comparative religion there, and he teaches, um, he's been teaching there for quite a while, and he's one of the, really the OGs of the, uh, of the Tulab al-Ilm in, in the Dawah at the time. So thank you so much for, for coming on. Thank you, Dr. Thank you so much. May Allah increase you. Thank you. All right, brothers and sisters, there you have it. Um, really, really useful and important information for all of us to have on the situation in the world today. We're not dealing with merely a situation of people with uh, dealing with financial issues, political, you know, geopolitics and economics. We do have people who have people with um, um, really end time beliefs and that's what's going on. And that's what they're doing. When, when Netanyahu evokes the Amalek, you know what that means now. Uh, when the Christian Zionists, when you drive on Texas, uh, from Houston all the way to Dallas, it's all mega churches with massive Zionist flags bigger than the American flag. You now know the source, okay? They have an original source. It's, it wasn't simply, you know, um, Jewish scheming against the Protestants that 
you know, made them go this direction. They have their own reasons to believe this and their own people. Now, who was behind Darby? Maybe we'll, we'll never know. But then again, there you have a religion, subhanAllah, where one guy cooks up an idea. And it is now the religion of millions. This would never happen in Islam. Like one guy cooking up an idea that's completely antithetical to the book and the sunnah. You're not going to get away with this for too long. And if you do, it'll be a minority. But this is now the majority of Protestantism. And Protestants are all about bringing back Zion, bringing back the land uh, of Israel for Christ. Yet we found that in Orthodox Judaism, if you didn't watch, if you didn't see this, Orthodox Judaism, this is completely sinful. Upon every righteous Jew is three oaths, as Dr. Adi brought forth. One, uh, and they essentially entail, we, have, we accept our exile. We will be good citizens wherever we live, and we will do nothing. We will not take a single action to bring back uh, the, 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 the Holy Land. Okay? We will do nothing. So, very interesting, very informative stuff, and I'm happy we, he brought something that wasn't, that really is a continuation. You should watch the Blogging Theology uh, Radical Judaism episode, and then watch this. It's a continuation of it, and you'll learn a lot that you didn't see there. Okay, so, all right, let's, let's open up for some Q&A. We got maybe a few minutes to do some question and answer. Uh, Omar, was there someone at the door or something? Oh, Zishan got his food. Mashallah. La <sighs> Akbar. He's getting his food. Well, well, what kind of food is it? Is a question. Peri peri chicken today. Whoa. Well, uh, probably less calories than pizza. Yeah. We got to look into anti-Zionist or non-Zionist evangelicals and non-Zionist Jews. We need to get them on. And I would like to have a debate, to be honest with you, with an Orthodox Jew and Rabbi Andrew Meyer. Because, you know, like, uh, it's, it's very difficult. It's very difficult in, in any text, any tr actual interpretation, to just render things a metaphor. It causes more problems for you than it solves. Okay. Now, this r young rabbi, Andrew Meyer, he seems like a nice guy, right? But he does have this interpretation that, that a lot of this stuff is metaphoric. We know those, this group in Islam, right? We just dealt with them, right, last spring. Omar, you went with us, right? Oh, you missed it. When we went to L.A. and everything is a metaphor and blah, blah, blah. That causes more problems than good. You're going to find more inconsistencies with that when you go the route of everything is just a metaphor. Okay, so I'm of the belief and the opinion that the Amalek and the verses on Deuteronomy are actual commandments. Okay, they're actual commandments. Now, Maimonides, he got around it. He said, yes, they're commandments, but they can only be established by uh, a, a, a king. Well, we have a king right now. Israel has a king, right? Israel has a leader. Um, okay, could it be that the Messiah they're waiting for is the Dajjal? Our concept of the Dajjad you find in our books is the Messiah of the Yehud. That's where they line up. The, anti, the Dajjad for, of Islam and the Messiah of the Yehud is one and the same. There they will follow the Dajjad. And only few of them, individuals, afrad, individuals, will accept Islam. Christianity is the opposite. There will be very few of the people of the book, here meaning Christians, except that they will believe in him, Jesus, before his death. This is another sign that Jesus hasn't died yet because we don't see uh, people of the book believe in him. Like why they don't need to re-believe in him, right? They only have uh, a false belief about him. So we don't see the majority of people of the book believing in him properly. Meaning, they will believe in him correctly. They, they believe in him incorrectly. Allah would not call a false belief iman, right? So, our concept of the end of time is that there will be an antichrist. He comes after Imam al-Mahdi. Imam al-Mahdi is a regular man, but of course he's guided. And he's special. But in regular man, I mean he's not a prophet. And he unifies the Muslims. 
He doesn't unify them just with words. There are wars, civil wars within Islam. His first war is in Hijaz. His second Hijaz being the Arabian Peninsula. So he unifies it under his leadership. He's resisted. He's fought by the people of Hijaz. The second battle he wages is Syria. Then Iraq, Persia after that. He's going up all of this. Who is his one supporter that he doesn't have to fight and they join him? Khurasan. Afghanistan. Okay. Khurasan is an area of land. The bulk of it is in Afghanistan and part of it is in Persia. So we could say in our world that we know today, that area of Afghanistan. He, they won't, he won't have to talk to them. They will come to him. He won't have to fight them. They will come to him okay, and support him. Then he goes up to Constantinople. Constantinople, of course, being Istanbul. And when they hear the takbir, when they hear him, the takbir of that army, they will submit. So there will not be a fight. They're, they will be ready to fight each other, but there won't be a fight. They will submit to him. So imagine the magnitude of this ummah now. The Egyptians say, we are tabai sham. The Egyptians say that when, whatever sham is mentioned, in the end of time, Egypt is taba to that, follows to that, because there is a connection between sham and Egypt, which is Sinai Peninsula. That's what the Egyptians say, because the Egyptians have to, oh, we cannot be involved. We have to be part of this, right? Okay, so, and Allah knows best. But that is a massive, massive, massive entity. So massive, what do they decide to do? They go to Rome to start going into Europe, the lands of Rome. And in specific, Rome in specific, and the Vatican in specific. Why? Because they say these shoveling gold with their shields, shoveling gold, which is interesting because they say they have shields. Could be shields of, doesn't necessarily mean shields against arrows and swords. It could be shields of other sorts. Who knows what the world is going to bring us. But this is the, 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 the typical end time narrative that you're going to hear from the sound sources of Islam. While the Muslim, that army of the Mahdi is in Rum, in Rum, Bilad Rum, they're going to be called back. Why? Because they hear the Dajjal has come. Now notice, when they leave, right, when they hear about the Dajjal, they go back east. The Dajjal is coming from the east. The Dajjal is not coming from the west. We may view the west as a source of profligacy and kufr and all these problems, but the Dajjal comes from the east. The greater danger is in the east. So they go back to their homeland, to, to their wives and children, who they have left to go to war. And they seek to protect them. So much so is Dajjal attractive to people that a, that a Muslim will have to lock his door from his mother, his, mother and his wife, his mother, and his mother-in-law, and his daughters being tempted to go and look at the Dajjal. Because they hear so many wonderful things about him. It's like the whole world loves him so much. And he's tugging at the heartstrings of, the, of, of people. That a, a, man, a, a man will have to lock his door and, and stand by the door and make sure the women of the house don't go. Because they're so tempted just to look. Dajjal is so attractive and tempting that one glance at him, one examination of him will trick you, right? except those whom Allah guides. So the soldiers and the army of the Mahdi and the people of the, of the Muslims at that time will stop expanding and stop fighting. They will just be busy guarding their own family from the Dajjal. The Dajjal then will gather a great army and will the, the, the army of the Mahdi that is out fighting all right, will be jammed in Jerusalem. And they will be neutralized. Every person, every prophet, even prophets, they have what Allah has permitted them to defeat and what Allah has not permitted them to defeat. Okay? The, the great Imam al-Mahdi, he is given the, the, the permission, the divine tawfiq, the permission from Allah to unify the ummah, but he's not given permission to defeat the Dajjal. So the Muslims will be hunkered down, almost besieged, by the army of the Dajjal, which is now taking over the world. So this great rise of Muslim unity of Muslim lands 
will now give way, that almost as if you could say the next chapter, is the rise of the Antichrist and the dead jet. Okay. And he puts the end to this rise, and he brings his own form of domination. And he travels, listen to this hadith, if you don't believe in the prophet after this hadith, you're just being stubborn. The prophet, peace be upon him, said, the Antichrist, the Dajjal, will travel the world on a beast with eyes all along its side that can jump through the clouds. So what beast is there in the world that jumps through the clouds and has eyes all along its side? Other than an airplane, right? I mean, how crystal clear is it? Prophet Peace said, the, the width of this beast is the width of 40 mules. Like, what is the difference, the, the, the length between the ears of a mule? Like, what, this much, right? The width of 40. And down its side are eyes. And it leaps in the cloud. If you don't believe in the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, after this, you must simply be just, just being stubborn. Even in the year 1800, nobody could have predicted planes coming around, let alone the year 600 of the common era when the Prophet lives. Six, um, 570 to 632 is in the common era when the Prophet lived. Okay? So the Messenger وسلم, tells us that now the Dajjal's kingdom, an evil kingdom, will rise, okay? and the Muslims will be neutralized. Until when? This will not last forever. Okay? It will only be a, f a short period of time. In that, sh it will be a short period of time. One or two years. How do they say one or two years? Because the Prophet, peace be upon him, said he will expand his kingdom in 40 days. One day like a year. One day like a month. One day like a week. And the rest of the days like the rest of the days. So they said that it's like a year, a year and two or three months. Right? So he will expand almost the way COVID took over the world in like a year and a half or something. So within a, sh a short period of time, he will dominate the world and lure everyone with darkness in his heart to him. And the prophet talked about the Dajjad. He said he is one-eyed, meaning he's blind in one eye. doesn't mean he's a cyclops. Okay? Do you know that I taught this to kids for a long time, like high schoolers, and they said, He's a cyclops. I said, not a cyclops. Blind. He's one-eyed means blind in one eye. He has two eye sockets, right? But one of them's blind. One-eyed does not mean a cyclops, okay? This was high school, Islamic school, right? I said, come on, Sheikh, a cyclops? What cyclops? What are you talking about? He said, one-eyed. No, not one-eyed like that, meaning one eye sees and one eye is blind, okay? And this is becoming fashionable, by the way, these days, the idea of the one eye, because it's been documented that every successful musician out there, right, has done this cover-up one eye look. Illuminati. Yeah, Illuminati symbols on, uh, on their, um, uh, you know, uh, taking a picture on a record or something like that. In any event, the yeah, the dollar has it too. You know the all security forces and stuff, they say the all-seeing eye, meaning we're, we're securing the land. And even Saudi, I went to some guy and I said, yeah, right? Why it, would it be that you, Saudi, Muslim, have an eye as a symbol for the Saudi security, right? He's like, oh, well, this is all-seeing eye because we're securing. We need to secure. So I said, well, why don't you be more secure if you had two eyes, right? <laughs> <laughs> what would you rather, security guard with one eye or two eyes, right? So, but I said, Yaqi, this is alamat al-Dajjal. Dajjal is one-eyed. Like, why would you put that? He's like, he never thought about that. He was like surprised. But in any event, um, the Dajjal, he reigns, he rules until the descent of Isa ibn Maryam. Now, all of this happens in one generation. The, the Mahdi his entire time when he unifies the ummah in these wars, it's only a few years. Okay? The Dajjal rise, one to two years. Then Prophet Isa bin Maryam comes back. The entirety of the reign of the Mahdi is seven years, which include a time by himself, a time against the Dajjal, and a time with Prophet Jesus, and the Dajjal and himself, and a period of time with only himself and Prophet Jesus. 
meaning Prophet Jesus kills the Dajjal. The Prophet Isa bin Maryam comes back and he goes straight to the Tel Aviv airport. He, he descends in Syria, okay, and then he comes straight to Masjid Al-Aqsa. He prays with the Muslims, but refuses to be the Imam. Imam Mahdi said, the Prophet Isa says, the Ikama was called for you. You are the leader. So Prophet Isa bin Maryam, as an honor to the Messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, lives his first few years, which matched the Mahdi's last few years, as a follower of the Mahdi. So the Mahdi, the lineage of the Prophet, peace be upon him, as an honor to the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and an honor to Al-Hasan. Al-Mahdi is a descendant of the, of the Prophet's grandson, Al-Hasan. Al-Hasan gave up the Khilafah to bring the Muslims together, so Sayyidina Isa refuses to take it away from him. Okay? As an honor not only to the Prophet, but to Al-Hasan ibn Ali. Al-Hasan ibn Ali abdicated the, the caliphate to keep the Muslims together. Prophet Isa ibn Maryam refuses to take the rule of the Ummah from the descendant of Al-Hasan. Okay? So he keeps him and he lives for a few years under, or, or not actually can't say a prophet is under, but as a follower of Al-Hasan. Then Prophet Isa immediately marched to what is now the airport of Tel Aviv. It's Bab Lud in the Hadith of the Prophet. If you look at it now, it's the Tel Aviv airport. And there he kills the Antichrist. He faces the Antichrist directly and kills him. Okay? Kills him. Thereafter, and, and, I, and I have I've left off a lot of things, such as Al-Malham Al-Kubra, the great slaughter, in which the Dajjal's forces will do a, a massive slaughter on Muslims. Massive slaughter. Like, you, I don't know, nuking North Africa. Uh, who knows what that means? Okay. They will kill so many people. Okay. It is said that if someone were to th fl uh, fire an arrow in the sky, okay, that it would come down red. Why? Because the things of the, the, the birds of the sky would be dying. Okay. And Allah knows best. Okay. But point being is that it will be, uh, there will be a great war, which we call Armageddon. Prophet Isa comes as in the middle of that battle and he changes the tides, okay? And he kills the Antichrist and that war is finished. Now, keep in mind, miracles to us, the great miracles come to Prophet Jesus, okay? Then there are lesser karamat that happen, okay? What else happens after this Armageddon? Prophet Isa, the... the, the, the great force of darkness of the earth that's spread on the earth and causing all these problems is gone. After this battle, the height of the battle is in Jerusalem. Okay. Prophet Isa then marches through the whole world. He doesn't rest. There is no rest. He marches throughout the entire world telling the people, here is the truth. This is the final hour. There is no more jizya. No more dhimma. What is jizya and dhimma? To be a dhimmi is, listen, I don't want to enter Islam, but I'm not going to fight. I'll just live under your roof as Muslims. Okay? And I'll live, I'll just stay Christian, I'll stay whatever. I say, fine. You pay us, you don't stay in the army. You don't go to the army. Okay? But you pay a jizya. Prophet Isa is saying there is no time for this anymore. There's no time for jizya. Accept this message or I'm fighting you. Okay? He does this. And where is the biggest resistance that he's going to have? And the biggest battle that the Prophet Jesus is going to fa face? India. It's called, uh, as the hadith of the Prophet says, Ghazwat al-Hind. Ghazwat al-Hind. Right? Ghazwat al-Hind is mentioned by the Prophet because it is so massive. Okay, It's already how many billion people living there? Almost 2 billion people. Okay. How much idolatry, how much of a stronghold does Iblis have on that area? Okay. Such a stronghold. And that will be a massive fight. But he will travel the entire... He won't stop. Prophet Isa bin Maryam will go and spread Tawheed and Islam and the truth everywhere. He will come back being inspired with the Quran. He will be know the Quran. He will know the Sharia. And he will live on the law of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 
He will affirm the truth that Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam was a prophet. He will break the cross and bring all the Christians unified with Muslims. The Christians will leave off all of their cross, crucifixion, Trinity beliefs, and believe the truth about the Prophet Isa bin Maryam, and they will see him in front of them. And keep in mind, there is only one prophet who the world has an agreement what he looks like. The whole world knows what Prophet Jesus looks like. For example, we can say what the prophet looked like, right? We don't depict the prophet, but we know how he looked. We know his hair was wavy, not curly, nor straight. We know uh, the skin tone. We know a lot of things about the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa He had a wide mouth, full lips. So if you bring me someone with a thin mouth, small mouth and thin lips, we know it's not the prophet. You bring me someone with curly hair, we know it's not the prophet. Perfectly straight hair, blonde hair, brown hair, red hair, we know it's not the prophet. There's only one person in the world, you show him this picture, in China they'll know who he is. That's Jesus. The reddish hair that looks wet, that's, that's wavy, that's down to the shoulders. As the prophet said the same thing. A reddish feature to him with a beard okay, and always looks wet and of a lighter complexion. Moses of a darker complexion, the prophet in the middle. The entire world sort of will know who he is. Okay, There's a wisdom why that image is spread around. And it is the same exact image as the prophet described. Reddish hair, parted, down, flowing down, looks like it's wet. Ahmed Fazl, you need that check, right? Two checks. Two checks. Okay. Um, I'm sorry. I didn't write them yet. Can you, um, in, in the trunk, the checkbook's in the trunk. Can you actually get it? The keys are in my jacket. The checkbook's in the trunk. I got a pen. I'll write the checks. Okay. Never thought about that. The image stuff? Yeah. The whole world needs to know who, what he looks like because he's going to come down. I'm Prophet Ace of Mother. How do you verify? We all know you. Everyone knows his face. Oh, Jack, it sounds serious. That their face is so widespread. Yeah. Like, it's impossible you don't know. Yeah. Like, even if you go to, like, some remote village in, like, mm -hmm. America. They're going to know who he is. Yeah. Um, so, Prof, the Imam Mahdi brings all the Muslims together and ends any division amongst Muslims. There's no more khalas uh, following any group. You don't need to follow opinions. You have the final mujtahid Imam al-Mahdi. And then Prophet Isa's role is to bring the Christians into the fold with, of Islam. I tell this to Christians all the time. They laugh. I said, well, let's wait and see. I'm not, I'm not going to argue. It's the truth. Wait and see. Prophet Isa comes inspired with the knowledge of the Quran and the Sharia. Okay. You think that's far-fetched? I said, why do you think that's far-fetched? How about rising up? for 2,000 years in the heavens and then coming back down, right? You already believe that. So why is it far-fetched that he'll be inspired with the Arabic tongue and the knowledge of the Quran and the knowledge of the sacred law? Imam Mahdi passes away, then Sayyidina Isa travels with the Muslims and he does this. For many, many years, not just a few years. This one is a longer period of time. Now, where is the limit that Allah has placed? Prophet Isa bin Maryam does all of this until Allah brings out a group of people who have lived long, long ago that we believe as an article of faith, essentially, not an article of faith, but we believe in it. They are human beings who have been living somewhere under the ground for centuries. Now, someone says, oh, we're in an age of science. You believe in this nonsense? I actually believe that science is a lot more limited than we imagine it to be. There is a lot that we don't know. So yes, I do believe in it. Yet Juj and Met Juj are two tribes and they are so many people, so many people and they will finally break out and rise to the surface of the earth. You know that there are caves, there are caves in Asia that are so huge you can fit entirety of New York City in them. Like in China, I saw something. There are caves that you could fit a whole country in them and there is ways in which they get sunlight too. Right, but they're below the surface of the earth, deep in caves. Who knows? We don't know these things. Okay. So yet, Juj and Met Juj, Prophet Isa is not given permission to defeat them. In other words, he cannot defeat them. What does he do? He rises with the Muslims to the mountaintops. Yet, Juj and Met Juj come on the earth, and they do such a amount of damage that cannot be described. Oh, I'm sorry. The checkbook it's like in the trunk yeah 
foundation. It's a big black uh, book, big black uh, binder. They do such an amount of damage, it's, it's unspeakable, that even the great prophet Isa flees from them. Okay? Nobody can stop the, Jew, the tribes, yet Juja Majuj, until how do they die? A virus. Clearly, that makes sense because, in, in fact, they're not in their natural atmosphere. It's only a period of time. It's not even, you know, we can't even say multiple years, just a short period of time. They come up, they do immense amount of damage to the world. Then Allah brings down a great rain that washes away their bodies. And the earth rains and rains and rains. And that brings us to the last period of the earth. And that is a period of great revival of the physical earth. The sources of pollution are gone. The rivers are flowing clean again. Okay. And this is a wonderful period in which no one, no one resists. And no nobody is inclined to evil. Goodness has spread far and wide. The Prophet, peace be upon him, said about this, a little girl could walk from one town to the next. She won't even worry about wolves, right? And another narration, because even the wolves will be, won't even have the, the anger inside or the, the aggression inside them. In another hadith, all she would worry about is wolves, right? So the humans, the, the, the males will be safe. The, the people will be clean. The Prophet, I said, said, the earth will be so revived that a whole family a whole tribe can eat a watermelon a whole tribe that's how big the fruit will be the animals will be so fat that when people give zakah charity when they give their charity money that nobody will know who to take it or, uh, who to give it to there will be nobody to take it nobody will say i'm poor i need the money everyone will be will have wealth that they need and if they don't have the wealth they need they'll be satisfied no one will take it. A man will walk around with his zakah and not know where to give the zakah. It's a very sweet period. And the, the work that Prophet Isa and those companions put through forth, they now reap the rewards of it. Until, and the capital now moves to Medina, al Medina al Munawwara. And there, the Prophet Isa bin Maryam okay, uh, will pass away. And there is a gap at the grave of the Prophet Sallallahu on the left, that is saved for him. And he will be buried there. After what? After having married and had children. Then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, a small, a, a very cool breeze will come, meaning an era, a short period of time, maybe a year or two years, very peacefully, very slowly, all the believers will die. A peaceful death then there will be no more Muslims on the earth, no believers on the earth. Remaining only on the earth will be the scattered people who refuse to follow Prophet Isa bin Maryam and stuck stubbornly to their idolatry. Okay, And they will be the worst of people because they saw the truth. The truth had all the wealth. They still didn't go into it. Like, wouldn't you go, okay, at least they're the winning side. They got all the wealth, right? Even that they wouldn't do. Here, could you write them? I'll sign them. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's not even like, because you know, a lot of people, they give up religion for material. Yeah. Means. Even that, they don't even, they don't even. Uh, uh, it's really like the worst. You might be the worst of the worst. At least come in to enjoy the, the wealth, right? Sure. Then the major signs, there are more major signs would come after that. Khalas. There's no iman after that. Like, if you cannot believe after that. It's there. Pen is there. In, inside. Inside the binder. The first four signs are known. The order. Mahdi. Dajjal. Sayyidina Isu bin Maryam. Ya'juj and Ma'juj. The next six signs, it's unknown when they'll come. But there will be a point, khalas, like if you didn't accept this, then that's it. Your heart is locked. And the calamities of the end times, now we don't know how long they'll live. Be a world full of just non-believers. Nobody else. Just non-believers. Right? No, we don't know how long of it. Even the Prophet Sallallahu said that time will pass. There will be life on earth after all the Muslims passed away. But there will be no Iman on the earth. And that people will say, right, Mecca used to be a place that Muslims lived, that, that people lived. It used to be a populated city. 
Medina will be, be a pop, used to be a place people lived. Or they used to say, someone will say, so generations will live. So much so that some people will say, we had grandparents. I remember them saying something about Allah. The word Allah. Like they don't even know what it is. So generations will live, but there will be no Iman, no Islam. Masajid will just be buildings and they'll be empty. No one will go into them, right? So it's as if to say that generation of believers will die off. The rest of the non-believing world will continue to live on. And then Islam will be a forgotten thing in the world. The world will move on, right? Then the judgment will come upon them because there will be no true believers on the earth at that time, okay? Is this lasting? Uh, how much time is this lasting? Allah knows best. But we do know the Mahdi rules seven years, Prophet Isa rules 40 years, and they do overlap for one or two or three years. So the entire thing is one is in within one generation. If you live to see the beginning of it, you'll see pretty much Prophet Isa bin Maryam. If you live to see the Mahdi, you will. Pro if you live a normal lifespan, you'll see Prophet Isa bin Maryam. It all happens in one generation. Then once that generation dies out, after that, uh, only the worst of the worst will live on. Ahsan Zafar says, what about the hadith about the Ummah lasting 1,000 or 1,500 years? Where do you get that? That comes in, two, in a weak hadith. In the weak hadith states that the Prophet wasallam asked Allah, how much will my Ummah last? Allah responded to him, if they obey, a thousand years. If they disobey, or, or a, a day. A day with Allah is a thousand years. If they disobey, half a day. Five hundred years. So Siulti surmises, and he has a little treatise on this. Siulti surmises, the Muslims were good in the beginning. They had a thousand years of goodness. Then they'll disobey. They'll only get five hundred years. So he says that the history of the whole Ummah is, is 1,500 years with speculation. He's speculating. Why is he speculating? He says, why else do we have this hadith? Allah wants us to think about it, right? He wants us to think about it. So that's the concept of where we get this, this idea of 1,500 years. Then he does math backwards. Does the math backwards. So if we know that the Prophet Isa rules 400 years then upon his death is the death of ummah so 1500 minus 40 is 1460 okay and then 1460 then we know that imam mahdi comes before him for a few years by a few years so 14 what how many years five years six years who knows we don't know how long so 1450s right around that time and ultimately, at the end of the day, this is not encouraged for a Muslim to do, this mathematics. He maybe just did it, wrote it once, but it's not something he preached regularly or wrote about all over his books. Why? The unseen, you're spying on Allah, essentially. It's as if you're spying on Allah. Leave the future to Allah Ta'ala. If he wanted us to know, he would have told us. I love what Habib Omar always says. He says, what will you do if the Mahdi comes? Right? What will the Mahdi ask you to do? Act by the Sharia, right? So we already have the Sharia, and we can act upon it now. So you just keep doing it. Mahdi is not bringing a new law. Prophet Isa is not bringing a new law. Okay, except that he abrogates the jizya. Okay, he abrogates the, he abrogates jizya. Okay. So uh, these are the. Uh, that's a summary of what Akhir Zaman is, and as you see there, the two great wars. One around that middle area, the Middle East area, Jerusalem, and the second one in India. And what does the Quran say? أَشَدَّ النَّاسِ عَدَاوَةً لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَلَا تَجِدَنَّ أَشَدَّ النَّاسِ عَدَاوَةً لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا You will find the most w hateful in their animosity towards you. Most, the, the, the strongest in their hatred of you are al yahud and those who worship false gods who worships false gods on the earth india you go to china do you see false gods all over the place no china they're like i don't know what they're on confucian some christians but but one thing is true you don't go walking around seeing false gods if i go to a chinese store 
we have some on East Brunswick. We got a Chinese like c- cultural store essentially. It's big, it's huge. I don't see I don't see gods. I go to any store, any store, even the the ninety nine cent store, the one dollar shop, right in my near my house, North Brunswick. You go and you buy like lighters, lighter fluid, and stuff like that, regular stuff. You go to the to the cash register. There's little gods, five cent gods, five dollar gods, right? <laughs> It's gods everywhere. So truly, the people, truly shirk right now is in is in India more than anywhere else. Right? Buddhists are, are, are of two different types. Thank you. I'm sorry for not writing them earlier. They, they have different types. Some hold him as a holy man. Some hold him as, I think they worship him. Right? I remember that back in uh, comparative religion days. There was the uh, two strands of Buddhists. I thought they were just like venerating him. Because like, they all say he's a human that came from the... Well, yeah, they're split in two. Oh, some they're split in two. Lie. Some, yeah. Yeah. SubhanAllah Adim. All right, let's see what else Jason Atridis says. The remaining period of your stay on the earth in comparison to the days before is like the prayer of Asr and Sunset in Bukhari. So... Asr to sunset is means three fourths of human history is over. Right? The advent of the Prophet himself marks three fourths. All right, thanks, Wes. All right, marks the three fourths of the day. Okay? What does Habib Omar say? He said, all of the minor signs, the, the minor signs mostly have come. We're waiting on the big, the, the major signs. And the bulk of that period of time, of that era, of the end of time, the bulk of it is gone, but the worst of it is yet to come. What is all this? Someone said you didn't eat on stream today, so I think. Huh? Someone said you didn't eat on stream today. All right, so Zabe, open up. Yeah, open up. <laughs> all right. Uh, the people of the Torah, says Jason were given the Torah and they acted upon it till midday. Ah, so Prophet Isa's advent is, would be, he's citing hadiths. I know these hadiths, I just didn't remember them until he mentioned them. Then they were worn out and were given the reward of their labor. Okay. Then, okay, so midday would mark the coming of Jesus, which is, it, it is sort of makes sense in the sense that humans had forgot the power of Allah. Halfway through, the Prophet Isa bin Maryam is a reminder of the creative power of Allah and that this cause and effect that we live with every single day only exists because Allah wants it to exist, not because it has any power in itself. It's a reminder of God's power. The creation of Jesus without a father. Okay, It's a reminder of God's power. All right, open up. Okay. Thank you for these hadiths, Jason. What's the, what, what question? Which one is that? AD says, ex Shia here. All right, mashallah, good for you. I'm confused about something. Why is Muawiyah considered a Kharaji? He's not. We don't consider Muawiyah a Kharaji. Even though... Oh, well, why is he not considered a Kharaji? Even though he did Khuruj against Ali. Khuruj requires you to submit and then rebel. He never submitted in the first place. And we hold his submission, his his non-submission to be an error based upon an incorrect attempt to find the truth. You see? We hold okay, the refusal of Muawiyah to submit to Ali's Khilafah, Sayyidina Ali's Khilafah, to be based upon an error in seeking to find the truth. Okay. Why do we uphold as Sunni, as Muslims, the honor of Muawiyah as a companion, as someone whose mistakes are mistakes of errors as opposed to evil? Why? Because we are in fact upholding the Prophet with that. The Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam appointed Muawiyah, Sayyidina Muawiyah, as a scribe of the Quran and of his personal letters. Would the Prophet ﷺ leave his will, his words, the word of Allah in the hands of somebody 
who was who was dishonest, who was corrupt. So that's why the upholding of Sayyidina Muawiyah and his Adala, okay, is in fact upholding the Prophet. And the opposite is true. If you are going against Muawiyah, then what are you saying about the Prophet having made him a scribe? Okay, and there, there's no discussion the Prophet made him a scribe, right? And you know why there's no discussion? Because Shia themselves love a hadith that seems to put Muawiyah in a bad light. What's that hadith? The Prophet ﷺ said, get me Muawiyah, I need a scribe. They went and got Muawiyah and they found him eating. So they went to the Messenger and said, oh, he's eating. Well, first of all, he, he maybe was new in Islam. Maybe he didn't know when the Prophet calls you, you break everything, even your salah, you speed it up. Or some of the scholars said, if the Prophet calls you and you're praying a sunnah prayer or a nafila, non-obligatory prayer, even an obligatory prayer, you walk to him, answer him, do what he tells you to do, and go back and pick up where you left off. SubhanAllah. Imagine that. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam calls your name while you're praying Salat al-Dhuhr. You don't salam out of the prayer. You walk to him, fulfill what he needs you to do, because it's as if you're in prayer while obeying the Prophet. Okay? And, <laughs> and then you go back to where your prayer spot, and you where you left off. No takbir or anything. Just exactly as you left off. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was told he's eating the he they went a few minutes later when they assumed the person would have finished eating and they said oh messenger of allah he's still eating uh, two times now the prophet called you and you didn't come to answer him so what do we attribute this to he's new in islam right and we have other companions who did the same thing that's why allah revealed quran right why don't you answer to the Prophet, peace be upon him, when he calls you to, to do something, because Sahaba were doing other things and didn't come to the Prophet. So they didn't know. Ignorance is not sinful. So what did the Prophet say? The Prophet, peace be upon him, said, he's still eating. May Allah never satiate his stomach. Right? So you're going to prefer your food over your messenger? Right? Well, may you never get what you want from your food. Why did the Prophet do that? That removes his sin. That is an expiation of his sin. There is a hadith about the Prophet. The Prophet said, Oh Allah, whenever I get upset at my companions, make it an expiation for their sins. So that when the Prophet is upset with a companion, that that upsetness wipes away their sins. Right? So, the first time, fine, he didn't know. The second time, no, that's not acceptable. Khalas, you've been eating for 30 minutes. Go and answer the Prophet, peace be upon him. That's no excuse for that second time. First time, excuse. Second time, no excuse. So they like to cite that hadith against Muawiyah. And, and Sayyidina Muawiyah did end up being somebody who could never satiate his stomach. He was always full. Right? He was, you know what some, some, some of the Mufassirin said? They said this was the Qur'an. Right? The pure marry the pure. And the filthy marry the filthy. Right? So what are you saying then about the Prophet, peace be upon him? And how are you going to curse Umar ibn Khattab when Sayyidina Ali ibn Abi Talib married his own daughter to Umar? Right? So what are you saying about either you're going to say something bad about Omar or you're going to say something bad about say Nadi's daughter or you're going to say something bad about Ali himself because he knowingly married his daughter off to Omar. So what are you saying about Omar, uh, Ali? He's marrying his daughter to a fasiq? It's all a convoluted uh, inconsistent thing that can be undone and disposed of quickly. Harun Mateen is in Europe. Okay. Jason brings us another. Say, what are your thoughts on this? We wrote in the Zabur after the message, my servants are the righteous shall inherit the earth. Yes, the true believers will always eventually inherit the earth. What does inherit the earth meaning? Have victory and be established in the earth. At the time it was... Uh, whoever was the prophet of that time was. It's for whoever was the prophet of that time. Okay. On Kel Kurach, I'm in Germany. I'm very interested in Tasawwuf, reading about awakening your heart with dhikr. 
Mm. Even if you do not have a sheikh, try to get up in the middle of the night and remember Allah and make dua and make much salah on the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and watch videos. You have it. Habib Omar there has a a German translator, Sheikh Mahmoud. His name is. Look for him. He has an institute. He teaches classes. Try to find. I don't know his last name. Uh, look up in your phone, Sheikh Mahmoud, Germany. Okay, he is um, your go-to in Germany. Inshallah. Does not seeing the Prophet in a dream mean that you are lacking? No. If you don't see the Prophet in a dream, it does not mean it, you're you're missing out on that virtue. Of course, there's no doubt about that. But we can't say that that person is lacking. Uh, in other words, his deen is defective. We cannot say that. He could be fully pious and upright and he doesn't see the Prophet Do you have any advice on increasing memorization and how to effectively retain what was previously memorized? Yes, simple advice to Ahadul Quran. Never miss a day. And be patient. Never miss a day. Continue to review and be patient. And don't listen to music and lower your gaze from the haram. Red Robin says, can you make an analysis about the events during Mahdi's return and our current day? It's uh, the best the best approach okay, to Akhir Zaman is just to read the sound hadiths and stop right there. It's not good to try to link them to today. Okay, Why? Because if you're wrong, people will say, oh, the whole thing is wrong. Right? Imam Ahmed was very strict on the signs of the end of time. Why? Because if a false hadith enters in and you believe it, then the opposite happens. What would you say of all the hadith? So that's why I take a very conservative approach. Just the safest approach. Cite the hadith as they have come soundly and stop there. We don't necessarily... But, but now what we can do is if it's a prophecy, then yes, we could look around and say it's here. Did not the Prophet ﷺ said one day there will become a time when metal speaks? And a sandal strap and the shoelace and and a man's stick or whip will tell him what's happening in his home. So what is sandal strap and whip is your everyday objects will be informing you about other mundane things, right? So my watch, my phone is informing me of what's happening in my family, what's happening in my life, what's happening in my home. I can know who's who's knocking on my door if I have ring. You know, the Amazon doorbell. All right. So, uh, that we can do. The Prophet, peace be upon him, talked about those competing in building tall buildings. Well, we see them in the desert. They're all vacant, and yet they're still... Why, why is everyone saying this stream is down? Mm, just refresh it, folks. Was Ghazwat al-Hind fulfilled with Muhammad ibn Qasim? I think, believe Ghazwat al-Hind is referred to for Sayyidina Isa ibn Maryam. Yeah. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we stop here. We can pick this up tomorrow, inshallah ta'ala. Jazakumullah khairan, everybody. Tomorrow, Islam in Japan and other things. A lot to talk about tomorrow. Uh with our guest tomorrow so make sure you join us for that jazakumullah khairan subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilaik wal asr inna al insana lafi khusr illa alladhina amanu wa amilu salihat wa tawassaw bil haqq wa tawassaw bis sabr wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullah Thank you.